gavel. Uh, the meeting will now come to order. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Vice Mayor Binsbacher? Here. Mayor Pro Tim Hunt? Here. Councilmember Patena? Here. Councilmember Finn? Here. Councilmember Edwards? Here. Councilmember Dunn? Here. All right, good evening, and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of May 7th, 2019. We have one item on the agenda this evening, and that's authorization to hold an executive session. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Please vote. And we will, it is unanimous and will now convene to executive session. You're watching the Veterans Business Journey, where we celebrate the achievements of veterans. Would you like to share your story? Drop us a note at vetsbizjourney at gmail.com. The Veterans Business Journey is made possible in part by the American Legion, Department of Arizona, American Legion Auxiliary, Department of Arizona, and the West Valley Foundation. feels like there is no way out. It seems like you are in this by yourself, battling alone. But you are part of one army family, shoulder to shoulder with a community there to get you through these hard times. There is no shame, no guilt in seeking out help. So if you are struggling, feeling depressed, or even having thoughts of suicide, it is time to talk to someone. Your Army family is committed to finding you the strength and hope you need to rebound from adversity. Because, above all else, our most essential resource is you. Today, more than ever before, women are on the front lines of America's defense. These brave women struggle and sacrifice to help keep our country secure. They deserve to be recognized for their service as guardians of freedom. We support the American Legion's efforts to serve the growing number of women veterans. Go to legion.org slash honor veterans to find out how you can help. When Claire Lansing joined the United States Army, she became one of the few women who qualified to drive the huge military two and a half ton cargo trucks. It's an experience she treasures. She says it transformed her life. I had no idea where I was going to go or what I was going to do with my life. So I got the wild idea that I was going to serve in the military and I could at least get out of my hometown and away from my parents and be independent and learn about life. And it turned out to be a really good opportunity for me. For Lansing, the opportunity came in the form of the GI Bill. Like other veterans, she decided to use her benefits to get an education. She earned a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in social work from Colorado State University. She credits her military experience for her achievements. One of the main things of being a soldier is that you exercise all the time. That's one of the basic uh, 
key elements of being a soldier is they encourage you to take care of your health. So obviously, I, I was inspired to take care of my health, my physical health, and to maintain my strength and, and endurance and, you know, in my life and incorporate that into my lifestyle. It was that discipline, her children, and the inspiration of her late husband, Cornelius Lansing, that encouraged Claire to transform an old post office building into what many consider as an oasis of healthy living. Her goal, to help people improve their quality of life and endurance. When I went to school, I, I learned about, um, you know, prevention and the key principles of prevention in terms of taking care of your mental health, your physical health. Claire Lansing is committed to finding innovative ways to help others understand the importance of staying healthy. Her military experience, she believes, provided her the foundation needed to establish a comprehensive rehabilitation service that addresses the physical, educational, and social needs of individuals. The first business that we opened was Saguaro Family Fitness Center. And the concept was to encourage people to look after one another and to be supportive. And, you know, the main mission in our facility was to take care of your health, to look after your health. That cooperation and support was a big factor, and I think that's seen in the military a lot, that people who are in the military look after other people in the military a lot of times. My name is Claire Lansing. I served in the Army and I am a proud veteran that I served in the military. It helped me a great deal. You're watching the Veterans Business Journey, where we celebrate the achievements of veterans. Would you like to share your story? Drop us a note at vetsbizjourney at gmail.com. I'm Jesus Hernandez. This is the Veterans Business Journey, where we celebrate the achievements of our veterans. The Veterans Business Journey is made possible in part by the American Legion, Department of Arizona, the American Legion Auxiliary, Department of Arizona, and the West Valley Foundation. Veterans represent 6% of the total U.S. population, but account for 13.5% or 3.7 million of all small businesses in the United States. These businesses employ 5.8 million Americans, pay wages in excess of $210 billion, and contribute $1.7 trillion to the U.S. GDP, or gross domestic product. Veteran-owned businesses help fuel the U.S. economy. You're dealing with pain, anger, a heaviness. It feels like there is no way out. It seems like you are in this by yourself, battling alone. But you are part of one army family, shoulder to shoulder with a community there to get you through these hard times. There is no shame, no guilt in seeking out help. So if you are struggling, feeling depressed, or even having thoughts of suicide, it is time to talk to someone. Your Army family is committed to finding you the strength and hope you need to rebound from adversity. Because above all else, our most essential resource is you. Staying at a hotel is not the same thing as staying at the Fisher House. The Fisher House, I know, is a huge part of Lane's recovery. For somebody like my husband or any military person, for them to know that their family members are being taken care of, that's a huge burden off of them. So they can concentrate on their therapies. Just having that assurance that no matter what, as long as we were there for Anson, that someone would be there to take care of us. It took so much weight off our shoulders. More than ever before, women are on the front lines of America's defense. These brave women struggle and sacrifice to help keep our country secure. 
they deserve to be recognized for their service as guardians of freedom. Please support the American Legion's efforts to serve the growing number of women veterans. Go to legion.org slash honor veterans to find out how you can help. I'm a veteran. We hit a mine in Vietnam. When I came home, I didn't know where to turn. As America's veterans face challenges, DAV is there. My victory's been never giving up hope. My wife is always there to remind me we have a life to live. DAV provides a lifetime of support, helping veterans of every generation get the benefits they've earned. I am a veteran, but after I got out, I spent two years alone and homeless. Every year, DAV helps more than a million veterans so they can reach victories great and small. My victory was finding the support to get back on my feet. Now I'm getting things right with my family. I finally admitted, with my PTSD, I wasn't doing well. But there's more to be done and more victories to be won. Now I wish I'd found DAV sooner. I am a veteran. My victory is just enjoying each day. Help support more victories for veterans. Go to DAV.org. Memorial Day, a moment to honor and remember with gratitude the thousands of brave soldiers, men and women who sacrificed their lives to protect our country. Memorial Day, a time to salute and praise the patriotism of countless of fallen soldiers who served to defend our country and protect our freedom. We recognize these brave and fallen soldiers who have left a legacy of honor. Veterans Business Journey is made possible in part by the American Legion Department of Arizona, the American Legion Auxiliary Department of Arizona, and the West Valley Foundation. You're watching the Veterans Business Journey, where we celebrate the achievements of veterans. Would you like to share your story? Drop us a note at vetsbizjourney at gmail.com. I'm American Legion National Commander Brett Rystead. A century ago, the American Legion was founded by veterans who had a post-war mission. Their mission, one that continues today, was to care for veterans, provide patriotic programs for our nation's youth, advocate for a strong national defense, and instill a societal pride in what it means to be American. It is our posts, however, that people see every day. Whether your post is 100 years old or 100 days old, this birthday, our 100th, is about you. The fact is that no program, no fundraising initiative, and no legislative achievement of the American Legion could ever succeed without the hardworking men and women that comprise our American Legion family. From the drafting of the original GI Bill to the creation of the VA, the American Legion has had an unparalleled record of success. I know that I can count on all of you to continue your dedicated service to our country and our American Legion. And if, like me, you believe the American Legion will continue to accomplish great things in its second century, let's all commit to recruiting and especially renewing past members so we can continue to be a strong American Legion for a strong America. For now, happy birthday, Legionnaires. We are Team 100. You're watching the Veterans Business Journey, where we celebrate the achievements of veterans. Would you like to share your story? Drop us a note at vetsbizjourney at gmail.com.
Hi everyone, and welcome to Cine Time. I'm your host, TJ. The Chandler International Film Festival and the city of Chandler are proud to share Cine Time, a chance for you to explore the international film festival and industry from the comforts of your very living room. In today's animated film out of Hong Kong, we explore a future where expansion and development are valued above nature and conservation. A young girl struggles to protect her beloved tree from being destroyed and ends up in the middle of a standoff with the developers. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Green Earth, directed by Kat Ku and Angela Wong. Oh, don't forget to stay tuned after the film for an exclusive clip with our filmmakers. Ladies and gentlemen, now presenting Green Earth.
I hope you all enjoyed that film, Green Earth. The animation brought me back to my childhood. The use of watercolors, wow. As promised, we do have an exclusive clip with our filmmakers, Kat Koo and Angela Wong. Let's take a look. Hi. Hi. I'm Angela. And I'm Kat Koo. We're from Rooftop, Rooftop animation. animation. And we're the creators of Green Earth. Green Earth is a watercolor animation about healing and rebirth. It's a story about a girl called Eva suddenly trying to protect her beloved tree from being destroyed in the face of progress and ends up in the middle of a standoff with the developers. So technique wise is um, we use digital watercolor as our main medium. Um, although we started off using papers, so it was pretty challenging. And the film was inspired by the social movement back in 2014 here in Hong Kong. Yeah, the movement ended in about a year, and the general public considered it a failure. So through the filmmaking process, we wanted to explore the feeling of helplessness and also the meaning of fighting for something you care about um, without knowing for certain that your efforts will be of any use at the end. During the process of making Green Earth, we learned a lot more about former social activists in the local community and abroad. Many of these movements actually ended without immediate results. However, the efforts have passed on through communities, art, and stories. So even the movement back in 2014 is an accumulation, a, accumulation of these efforts. In the end, Green Earth became a reminder to us to remember what we believe in and to also keep creating stories that talk about these things. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much uh, Chandler Film Festival for selecting our film yeah. and we hope that everyone enjoys the festival! Thanks! Bye. Bye! Thank you to our directors Kat Koo and Angela and a special thanks to you for joining us today. If you'd like more information about Cinetime, please check out our website. See you all next time. But for now, Cinetime is signing out. Goodbye, all. Go, Peoria on the go, the free circulator bus for North Peoria, with service every half hour from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Hogo starts at the Peoria Sports Complex, 84th Avenue and Mariner Way, traversing both directions up and down 83rd and 91st Avenues, all the way to Happy Valley Road. Hogo, Peoria on the go, bounce around town starting April 22nd. Peoria on the go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is John Sefton. I'm the Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities Director for the City of Peoria. Thank you for joining us as we strike the golden shovels into what will become Peoria's Paloma Community Park. Woo! This project has been a long time in the making, and I'm certainly proud to serve as MC today. And so everybody knows we are live on Facebook, so welcome to the viewers. Give us a like, share your like a hood uh, on Facebook, and uh, continue to spread the word about our wonderful amenities in Peoria. Joining us today are a number of Peoria elected officials and from Maricopa County as well. I'd like to do an introduction real quick, and you're going to hear from them. Supervisor Clint Hickman. Our Mayor, Kathy Carlett. Vice Mayor Bridget Binsbacher from the Mystique District. Also with us this morning, John Edwards from the Willow District, Vicki Hunt from the Acacia District, Bill Patena from the Ironwood District, and newly appointed last night, Danette Dunn from the Pine District. Thank you all for being here. I don't know that I've seen him, but I do want to recognize Councilmember Finn for his continued support of Parks and Recreation. 
We're also joined from Debbie Lesko's office, Senator Debbie Lesko's office, Chelsea Lett and Ken Fuelbeyer. Thank you for being here. And please welcome me in welcoming Jeff Tyne, City Manager, Jeff. Deputy City Managers, Katie Gregory, Eric Strunk, and Andy Granger. And I see across the crowd a number of uh, directors from Police Chief uh, Art Miller and Fire Chief Bobby Reese and a number of other directors. Uh, Kevin Burke, is he here? I know he's uh, uh, famous for doing pogo stunts. Uh, Kevin, if you and all the other directors could just give me a rise up, jump. All right. Thank you all for being here and for supporting us. A project of this magnitude and to be able to be at this pivotal and important place is the result of the hard work, passion, and dedication of many people. And one group of volunteers uh, that has been with us and guide us uh, here today is the Parks and Recreation Board. I have a number of, of members here today and I'd like to recognize Chairman Brent Taylor, Jerry Johnson, Anthony Van Gotham, Sherry Van Leuven. Thank you all for being here today. Now to build the most incredible park ever, it takes a most incredible team. So this list is long, so I'll give your claps a rest until I call for your applause. Uh, but if we hear you, if you hear your name, give us a big wave and thank you for being here. First, our partners and landowners from the Maricopa County Flood Control District, Mike Fulton, Scott Vogel, Stephen Brown, Tom Rankley, Patrick Schaefer, Mike Jones, Angie, Angie Hardesty, Bob Steven, Stevens, Eric Arntz, and Charlie Klenner, and a special thank you to LaTanya Jordan-Smith for her help in, in facilitating today. From the Bureau of Land Management, the Hacienda Field Manager, Rem Haas. From the Arizona State Park Historic Preservation Office, Mary Ellen Walsh. And from the Army Corps of Engineers, Commander Aaron Barta. As well from his team, David Van Dorp, Travis Bone, Deborah Lamb, Caitlin McAlpine, Alan Palaloran, John Sweeten, and Therese Carpenter. Without them, this place would not be what it's going to become. And we thank you very much from the city standpoint. From our city team, City Engineering Department, Adina Lund, Ed Striffler, Ann Durkin, and Kathy Sponsel. The work that they've already done and the work they're, they're going to do is absolutely phenomenal. From our Parks and Recreation Community Facilities Team, Deputy Director Chris Calcaterra and Community Parks Manager Jake Eason. I've got a handful of the crew here as well. Give me a big wave, guys. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for all your support. And thank you for the visioning of what it's gonna take to operate the day-to-day -day of Paloma Community Park. Now there's not a single park in our environment or in our system that didn't start with a plan. Environmental Planning Group's Dave Wilson uh, is the arch landscape architect that really helped to inspire and to drive and to fuse down to what really many, many, many different visions have, have contributed to, to what Paloma Community Park will be. So thank you, Dave Wilson. From Valley Rain and Hunter Contracting, again, you can't build a vision without the guys that know how to move dirt and go vertical. Kathy and Fred Dalzell are here. Dan Kowitzki from Hunter Contracting, Chuck English. Bob Carlson, Byron Burkholder, Stephen Brinkoff, Dig Cardi is here, Christian Williams, and uh, where's my Superman, Dennis Pantaleo? He's right in the back, always right there, unassuming, but he gets the work done. Thank you, Dennis, for being here, all of you. So I'd also like to recognize as we get going here, uh, the special events team, Bill Moss, Tanya, Andrea and the team, and all of our talented contributors for the event. Jared Spangler, Ryan, making the sound good. From the Office of Communications, Jen Stein, Christina Perez, Ed, Eric, Sean. Uh, they make us look so good in all the things that we do. Now, if I may, <clears throat> I want to harken back to a memory. Perhaps it was my first meeting with the mayor, then, uh, then council member of the Mesquite District. And believe it or not, it was about six and a half years ago. At that meeting, she spoke of a place that highlights the beauty of our Sonoran Desert a place that would have recreation amenities that would pique the interest and fuel the spirits of our city residents, our guests, and our visitors. She has consistently voiced the importance of parks, recreation, and the access to our open spaces. Three critical elements that help to build a complete city and ultimately our very special Peoria. 
She's held the resolve and the commitment to leading this project and to making today's little ceremony a reality. Please join me in thanking and welcoming our mayor, Kathy Carlett. Thank you. Wow, I'm so glad all of you are here. I think everybody here is taking part in something, building this beautiful park, doing something to build this park. And I am grateful to all of you. What a perfect day, huh? This is a perfect day and it's an absolute joy for me to stand here with each of you and celebrate Paloma Community Park. I, I can't tell you how it touches my heart. John is right. I have been wanting a park in the northern part of our city um, to balance the amenities that we have in other parts of our city for as long as I can remember. I have been pounding on the die as saying we need more lighted ball fields. We need another community park. We need to serve a lot more people than we are serving right now. And so today, today truly is a joy for me to stand here and thank you all of you uh, for not only being here today but for your contribution to making this happen making this a reality next time we all stand out here we're going to be looking at a completely different environment gosh what a what an amazing spot to have this park i just can't wait to see what it's going to look like so a thriving city can be measured by the opportunities provided by parks, natural open spaces, cultural amenities, and the unique expressions of the people who reside here. These places and spaces help define the character of a community and are an essential part of the values that enrich the quality of life. Paloma Community Park will be such a place. We're proud to live in this gorgeous Sonoran Desert as a well-balanced, growing city, it is imperative that we safeguard access to our unique natural environment and create outdoor recreation spaces that contribute to our mental and physical well-being. Close to where we are standing today, nestled up against beautiful West Wing Mountain as it proudly displays the wings of the dove. I hope you can, all can see that these are the wings of the dove here and that's what Paloma means. We'll soon be home to children racing across ball fields, families celebrating together, and friends strolling through picturesque paths, all while enjoying and sharing the scenic backdrop of the Sonoran Desert. We've spent many years carefully planning this park to meet the needs of Peoria residents, and it is a privilege to be here today with our committed community and regional partners to commemorate the groundbreaking of this amazing recreation area. And speaking of our regional partners, I wanna offer my heartfelt gratitude to the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, and in particular, Supervisor Clint Hickman for making this land available for the benefit of our shared stakeholders. Paloma Community Park will be here to serve the families of today and the families of tomorrow as they create memories that last a lifetime. And it all begins right here, right now, as we turn the first shovel of dirt. Thank you for being here to take part in this exciting Peoria milestone. And now please help me welcome uh, County Board of Supervisors, Clint Hickman. everything okay well first of all I, sh I should probably point out my chief of staff Scott Isham uh, here he does a he does a lot of work uh, for the county but one thing he doesn't do well is speech right so I got to who write who's writing your speeches it's a combination, it's a combination. Okay, Scott take note so this is his speech and again I will not reference it um, this there's a I will have to tell you there is a uh, I have a rich history out here uh, with with Peoria. I, some of you might know I'm a graduate of Peoria High School, 1983. Um, go Panthers! Uh, and this this has a tradition of a lot of community fun. Although this was the scene of a lot of maybe desert parties I might have attended. So now we're going to legitimize it with ramadas and actually invite people out here. I saw. Did I see the Peoria? Police chief walk up? Yeah. Okay. 
you didn't you weren't there you weren't here at that time lots of good kids out here having fun we'll we'll be again um i just want to point out how uh uh, fantastic it is for two governments to work together. I have my uh, flood control district uh, guys out here that are going that have been doing a lot of talking and a lot of uh, agreement making to the point where we're going to turn something. Let's just face it. This this beautiful stone wall out here uh, serves a purpose, and that's that's protecting the residents uh, downstream. It's it's flood control, but to be able to utilize an area that's that's meant to just uh, keep water out because, well, last night wasn't a severe rainstorm, but we've had them before. And to now be able to use land that was sitting out here in a raw state, kind of, kind of unproductive. It is pretty, but it was uh, unproductive. But now it's going to be turned into a fantastic amenity for the Peoria residents and, and Maricopa uh, County residents as a whole. So I couldn't be happier. If it continues to happen with our board that we continue to find uh, little gems like this out here, working with cities and their and their councils to bring uh, some vision, but then also bring amenities uh, to an area that wouldn't have been wouldn't have been used. So thank you guys for working hard. Thank you guys for working hard. It's happened in Phoenix, Gilbert, uh, El Mirage, and now Peoria. It's it's fantastic. So again, thank you all for coming out here. Uh, all the workers, thank you for what you're going to be doing here shortly. Uh, and it's going to be a fantastic. I can't wait to visit it. I already visit Pioneer Park. I already visit uh, Rio Vista. My son is a 12-year-old baseball player. So I, that county resident of that, that I live in Litchfield Park uses your parks probably as much as the Peoria residents do. So thank you for, for being there and thank you for all of us. So great, great being out here today. Thank you so much, Supervisor Clinton. Clint Hickman. Clintman. Clintman. Thank the eggs. They were there actually. I had Hickman eggs this morning for breakfast. Thank you. So the next the next part of our uh, campaign sponsored by uh, is uh, to, to give away uh, two raffles. We're going to back about two years ago, we ran a contest on the cover of our Get Active brochure. Help us name this park. We had over 650 names submitted. And through the process of our Parks and Recreation Board and then Chair, Mr. Brian Derrick, uh, then Chair, uh, no longer on the board, but serving in other capacities in this area, uh, we went through an extensive community process. So for today, we're going to do two drawings, one uh, from Southwest Bicycles for $600, and another from uh, Biker's Edge in Old Town Peoria for $500. So I'm going to invite Vice Mayor Bridget Binsbacher up to say a few words and to do the official drawing. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so much has already been said, uh, meaningful comments. And the one thing that I want to add, John Sefton said every major project starts with a plan. And I want to take a second to just say that this project started with heart, without a doubt. And I know you heard it in the mayor's voice and Scott wanted everyone to hear it in your voice today and that's why you had to improvise there and we did and that's what's going to make this so incredibly special and all of you all of the collaboration and everyone working together from all of these different entities and all these different layers it's it's magic it really is and i can't wait to bring the public in all of you on facebook watching this i can't wait to bring you all here for the grand opening uh, this is truly a result of a tremendous collaboration but the engagement of the community and this drawing too is thanking all of you at home that participated in some way or another um, in naming this beautiful park and this work today we're making history I want to thank my fellow council members for being here for supporting this from day one uh, and and supporting balanced amenities in our city and this is going to mean so much to so many families and I'm speaking from my heart I remember when Rio Vista was built and what it meant to my family and my 12 year old baseball player way back when but still um, thank you all for being here and being part of this unbelievable historical day thank you
Let's draw. All right, let's draw. So being Parks and Recreation, of course we have a handy bingo ball set. So we'll have Vice Mayor do the twirl and drop a ball. Okay, so I yeah, cranked the... It'll mix them up and slowly bring it to you. See that? Yeah, we'll grab a ball. We'll drop a ball. We've got one. Do I, I'm going to do this without... Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, Look at that. Wow. So I'm new to bingo. <laughs> okay, how does this? Oh, got it, got it. Okay. Oh, look at that. Okay. All right, so, so number 53. So from my other random, number 53 is Mr. Shane. And Shane D is the last name. I don't want to, because we're Facebook Live, I don't want to give away any personal information. But his email is, yes. just, kill, just kidding. So she, uh, Shane D provided the name back in the day of Desert Offspring Park. So Shane is the winner of a $500 gift certificate to uh, Biker's Edge, Biker's Edge in Old Town Peoria. And we'll do one more for $600. Thank you, Shane. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Mark C. And he submitted the name Lake Pleasant Park. So I've got their contact information. We're going to follow up this week. So Mark C. Who submitted Lake Pleasant Park, and Shane, who submitted. Where was Shane? And so much for my memory. <laughs> Desert Offspring Park. So congratulations, teams. Thank you so much for submitting names and being a part Thank of the, commu the community of Pe Peoria. And so if I'll have our elected officials, now's our opportunity for the golden shovel. We're going to take a short hike over to what used to be a Ramada. Now it's not a Ramada because of the wind. We've got a nice pile of fresh dirt over there to uh, do the ceremonial uh, dig. So stick around. We've got some great photos. And once we're done with the photos, that'll be the end of our uh, ceremonies. Thank you all for coming out today. And let's herd cats and council members. All right, so, so we do that. Okay. Okay. Are you guys ready? Three, two, one. one. Yay! Yay. photography originates back to the first photo picture as we know it, taken in 1825 by a French inventor, Joseph Nip. It was commercially introduced in 1839. Photography was appreciated as an art form by such artists as Ansel Adams, who was known for his black and white landscape photography. 
Photographer and instructor Jerry Seavey continues this tradition. Seavey, Paradise Valley Community College photography instructor, is well known for being featured on the covers of Arizona Highways magazine. I went to school at Glendale Community College in the 1970s, okay? And my uh, mentor and main, main teacher there was Willis Peterson. I took every photography class they had. And he introduced me down to, to Arizona Highways. A lot of what I teach is the same things he was teaching me. CV has worked for 28 years as a landscape artist, publishing over 2,000 images worldwide using his 4x5 field camera, which he still uses today. He recommends a digital camera for his current students. The photographer who inspired me the most would be Ansel Adams. He did a lot of the imagery that I was interested in, the grand landscape. I was very fortunate to actually see Ansel speak in, uh, uh, in the 1970s when I was a student at Glendale Community College. CV describes his art. An expression of my feelings from within, showing the, the essence of something, but not necessarily being object-oriented. Jerry CV, a renowned photographer, shares his passion for photography with students here at Paradise Valley Community College. Kristen Stow is taking CV's beginning photography class. He's actually been out there and he's been like working on the field and doing this stuff so like he has a lot of on-field experience can say listen like you know I've done this before and like maybe you could try it this way and then that makes us more successful like with um, when we were like shooting getting not only just like the flowers but also like the building behind it and kind of using that as a way to um, make like it so you, the, that like draws your attention down to the flowers. CV emphasizes the importance of having knowledge about how the camera works. The, the choice of lens affects how the image will present itself. F-stops and shutter speeds, what if you're using a fast sh shutter speed, uh, freezes the action of everything. If you're using a very slow shutter speed, movement can be seen. And we, we study different photographers who, who use various techniques, of various combinations of shutter speeds and and apertures. Composition and light are also highlighted in his class. After the students photograph, they come into the computer lab to edit their photos. CV emphasizes technique in the field and minimal editing on the computer. Yeah. Okay, we already talked about what is this little? Uh, they may crop the image a particular way. They may change the color saturation a little bit. They may change the horizontal orientation a little bit. Now that they have a finished product, CV recommends exhibition opportunities. Every year at PVCC, there's a student art exhibit, and they, they can enter that. And I try to keep them also informed of outside exhibits. Before submitting to an exhibition or art gallery, he teaches them about presentation. Once students are ready to approach an art gallery, Jerry tells them about what kinds of paper to print on and how to charge for their art. The student has to learn to choose the, the sort of paper that, uh, that works for them. Pricing photos is often based on size, media, and how many are in the edition. Ansel Adams' legacy helps to elevate photography as an art form. May his images and others continue to inspire current and future photographers. Jerry continues to produce photography and excite students about the art form. If you're inspired by CV's photography, perhaps you might consider taking classes here at Paradise Valley Community College. For more information about classes, go to paradisevalley.edu. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Spirit of the Arts. I'm your host, Andrea Zakszewski. People think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today I'm just an aluminum can, but one day I could be a stadium. I just basically told her, uh, all right, well you have a really great day and I love you. And I can't tell you um, how hard, how, how much I'm so glad that I said those words to her because she returned and said, I love you too, Mom. That would be the very last time I would hear those words from her. Worst 
day of our lives. Um, what we knew as normal no longer existed from that point on. And um, we had discovered after that that there were far too many people that didn't understand this was truly an issue. Domestic and dating violence, a quiet, secretive societal issue that affects one in four women in the United States. After losing her 17-year-old daughter to dating violence, Bobby Sudbury and her husband co-founded Katie's Way to honor their daughter and spread the word. We didn't even know it really had a name to tell you the truth. We didn't know that you know it could be referred to as dating violence or anything like that. We just looked at it as somebody was seriously harassing and bullying our daughter. Violence can take many forms, physical or emotional, isolation and fear, power and control. But domestic and dating violence is much harder to combat than normal crime. ASUPD is trying to change that. We're really trying to to bring awareness to this topic by having a victim advocate now, by having this new position. That means I respond to help provide emotional support, um, resources, whether that's in um, the outside community or within the ASU community, as well as the criminal justice education. Spillers, like Bobby, knows that domestic and dating violence is sometimes hard to spot, especially in young relationships. Social media and cell phone communication can be an early sign. Sometimes college students or even high school students, you know, might think it's cute that a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, a, you know, a partner is texting all the time or wants to keep track of them. Um, and, and those are red flags. Wanting to know your every move isn't, isn't cute or endearing. It, it's controlling and it can lead to other factors, right? It can lead to other um, risks in the relationship. They need to understand, uh, because abusers don't come in abusing. They come in very charming and decent. But if you understand the, the, the early warning signs, the coercive non-physical controlling behavior that goes on in the early stages, then you'll be more apt to say, oh no, this is not a relationship for me. If women, young or old, do not come to this conclusion on their own, they may end up here, at the Autumn House, a domestic violence shelter in the Valley. I've been the director of shelter services and I've been working for Newly for 20 years. So once they get here to Autumn House, the staff will greet them, bring them in the door, just, you know, welcome them, make them feel like they really are welcome. The Autumn House offers many services to its residents, many of them children who come with the mothers. It is not just a place to lay your head. Caseworkers are available 24-7 and educational classes are even on the premises. They want to feel safe. They want to feel like they don't have to constantly be um, vigilant about what's going to happen next and that's what we're here for is to help them find a way to move forward with their lives. It took decades for violence against women to gain traction. Now the field is dealing with how to prevent domestic and dating violence in younger generations. We need to educate people, especially youth, like in their language. They need to understand, number one, that that dating violence is a real issue. We've done a disservice to our children and not really teaching them what healthy relationships are and we can't start young enough. Bobby Sudbury agrees that domestic and dating violence awareness as well as healthy relationship education is the final answer to combating violence against women of all ages. Something we'd like to see happen along with some legislation to uh, um, mandate healthy relationship education in the schools. Senator Debbie Lesko, a state senator and someone who could bring Bobby's vision into legislation, knows this tragic story too well. And I was one of those women. I was educated. I had a good job. I uh, had graduated from college, uh, was successful, and um, I married the wrong man. My ex-husband was manipulative, abusive, uh, threatened my life uh, many times and threatened to take away our young daughter from me. And it's very scary, and it took me a long time. It took me about eight years uh, to leave him, but I finally did. Domestic and dating violence can cross any boundaries. It can happen to anyone. That would be my message. Don't be fooled, it could happen to you. We rationalize violence all the time, and we can't continue to do that. If we're going to end violence against women and children and, and men and boys as well, we've got to start with the very basics. We've got to start, like I said, teaching what healthy relationships are. And that is why all women, young or old, should be aware and help spread the message of safety and healthy relationships. You should educate yourself about this because it affects a human being. It affects someone. And so with statistics like that, um, it's, odds are it's going to affect you. Bailey Nach, Arizona Capital Television.
This is a Martin B-26 Marauder named Flakbait. It's a medium bomber that flew with the 9th Air Force during World War II, and it's the American airplane that flew the most missions of any other during that conflict. The 9th Air Force was a tactical air force, and so they flew in support of an anticipation of the Allied invasion in June 1944, and then they went across into France and Belgium to support that force as they rolled across Northern Europe. In August 1943, flying, flies all the way to the end of the war till May of 1945. Missions include flying during the D-Day invasion in support of that, during the Battle of the Bulge. And so the missions that these type of aircraft would have flown would have been to affect the outcome of the war on the battlefield. So they would have been flying against troop concentrations, rail yards, signal stations, just a way to, they can disrupt the way the Nazis could fight against the Allies. I think it's 150,000 tons of bombs are dropped by B-26s. And so it's a fast airplane in which it's a 220 mile per hour cruise, but it lands about 100 miles an hour. So there's a very small window of operational of slow to fast with this airplane. But they do their job This meeting will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Vice Mayor Binsbacher? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt? Here. Councilmember Patena? Here. Councilmember Finn? Here. Councilmember Edwards? Here. Councilmember Dunn? Here. Council Liaison Gilbertson? Here. Sorry. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Peoria City Council special, or excuse me, study session of May 7, 2019. We have one item on the study session agenda this evening. It's an update from Neighborhood and Human Services Department, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Tyne. 
Great. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and thank you, Council, for this opportunity. We're really excited to bring this uh, to you, an update on our newest department, the Neighborhood and Human Services Department. As you recall, as part of your livability initiatives, really there was an increased focus on, as Peoria continues to grow and mature to really focus on our neighborhoods and really look at the character and the needs of every single community that we have within the broader Peoria city. And with that in mind, uh, we do have a team together that really looks and has consolidated a lot of the functions that impact your neighborhoods. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Deputy City Manager Eric Strunk to introduce this amazing team that we've assembled here. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, Council. Uh, Jeff said everything I was going to say, so I'll just turn it over to Chris. No, in, in seriousness, um, as you know, uh, it was about a year ago, um, actually July 1, when the Neighborhood and Human Services Department was established. And we did that by way of kind of repositioning and reorganizing and redirecting key functions in our community and for our neighborhoods so that we could further connect with those in our neighborhoods throughout Peoria not only those existing, but those coming down the road. And tonight you're gonna to hear the story about how we're going to balance that. And both Chris Hallett, the director, and Kelly Kincaid, our deputy director, are gonna share that with you. Um, a couple quick things I just wanted to share with you. Um, even though it's been a year, kind of fast forward from last July 1 to almost July 1 now, um, we've not been sitting around. It's been very active. And what Chris and Kelly will more or less share with you tonight is their analysis and how that's kind of played out and some recommendations they're going to um, share with you. A couple of things that we've done over the past year, um, we obviously hired this gentleman here and we put Kelly in place and the team in place. That was very important. Had to get it served with some good bones. Um, we um, worked for or we worked towards the construction of the new um, extension of the community center. The um, the uh, Human Services Resource Center. That's very important, and that's something that we've been working on over the year through the Human Services portion of it. We've uh, retooled and we've created the Family and Youth Services Division, and our goal there is to provide even more opportunity for families and particularly youth, and, and we're starting to see signs of that, and we want to continue that on. Lastly, um, we brought before you, we've had a couple uh, good conversations on neighborhood preservation codes and, and, and neighborhood codes in general. Uh, you may recall last, last fall we, we had a conversation and we followed up with the creation of a subcommittee earlier this year and kind of worked that through uh, a conversation and we'll be bringing some recommendations to you here hopefully within the next month before the break. We're very excited about that. The most important thing though that, that has helped guide us and get us going are your livability goals. And that, that's just so key um, from a planning perspective. And that concept of healthy neighborhoods, that's what's really gonna drive our mission and that's what you're gonna hear a lot about this evening. So with that, I'd like to uh, formally introduce Chris Hallett. He's our Neighborhood and Human Services Director. You've seen him before. The community may, may have seen him before as well. He's gonna provide you with an overview of the department, uh, how it's structured for success, and discuss, along with Kelly, a series of, of kind of five-year objectives, short-term, medium-term, longer-term objectives. And as always, we wanna engage you in the conversation. It's very important to us. We think we've got a good game plan, but we don't go past go without uh, your, your okay and acceptance and, and general uh, direction on that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris, and we'll take you through our presentation. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. And uh, I want to thank you all. This is a true honor and privilege to be the uh, director of the newly formed Neighborhood and Human Services Department. And I'm here with Kelly, our Deputy Neighborhood and Human Services Director, to present an update on our department, along with present to you our mission and vision and philosophy that we're going to uh, run the department over the coming five to six years. We're going to outline here tonight. Um, <clears throat> We feel this is a really great opportunity, as, as Eric said, to piggyback on the healthy neighborhoods aspect. We were just here not too long ago on the livability, and at perfect timing, and we think this just dovetails nicely with what we're going to be doing as a new department to meet the needs of Peoria neighborhoods. So with that, in an effort to show how we can holistically best address the community problems, we'll be providing you an overview of where we've been, how we come to be, and take a five-year peek at what we're heading, uh, where we're heading while identifying multi-year objectives and keys to success. Of course, you'll have ample opportunity throughout the presentation as well as the end of providing input, so feel free. Now let's get started. So overview of our structure. Uh, we, the, 
Peoria is growing, as, as Jeff had mentioned, and it got to, I think, a tipping point. You know, we're almost 180 square miles large now and 175,000 residents strong. And we start to see some of the growing pains and some aging of the neighborhoods and some of the diverse needs of these neighborhoods. And I think it's uh, ap apropos that we come together as a new neighborhood and human services department to help better meet those needs. Uh, and that's the impetus for change to create this department. Uh, and we hope to meet the ever-changing and diverse set of needs. With that in mind, the city manager recommended and you all approved this reorganization. And again, I'm very happy to be here as part of that. Uh, and we're able to do it with existing resources. We pulled together four uh, high-performing divisions from three other departments. Uh, the community assistance division came to us from the planning and development. The family and youth services came to us from department formerly known as community services, as did arts and special events. Code compliance came over from police and we already changed the name. It was more of an enforcement nature over there. Uh, we hope they have a bit of a softer edge to them. We changed the color of their uniform, took the police patch off and showed more of an engagement uh, role that they continued to provide. Uh, but that was, so we have a department, we're set up, we're ready to go. And, uh, but we have, what drives us? Where do we go and how do we know how we're gonna get there? Well, that's gonna be our vision and mission as a department. And to do that, we wanted to best align with your council priority goals. And uh, to do that, we met with you all <clears throat> uh, right after the department was formed last summer. Uh, talked to each of you what the needs were for your, your areas as well as Peoria at large. We also did a 360 stakeholder feedback session. We met with all of our department uh, members. Uh, we did a visioning and mission statement uh, facilitation. We had several neighborhood-based engagement. We also had the luxury of the, the livability initiatives where I was captain of the healthy neighborhood. So we had uh, some great facilitation there. All in all, we took input from all these sources and this is a word cloud representing some of the strong words that were used. And so collectively, we're here today to, to show our vision and mission and you know, input from all these sources uh, we, we came up with a collective vision that Peoria is a community of healthy, vibrant neighborhoods where people want to live, work, and play. So how do we get there? Well, that's what our mission is, right? Our mission drives us to our vision. Uh, again, we, we relied heavily upon our Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative uh, informing our, our mission, and we came up with to improve the quality of life in Peoria by engaging residents, promoting safe and healthy neighborhoods, and creating a sense of community and pride. Uh, we're going to go a little more depth on how we're going to meet that a little bit later, but first Kelly's going to help go over a broader uh, overview of our department structure. So we have to sincerely thank you and the city manager's office for bestowing such a great management team to start our new department. Um, we couldn't have asked for or found a better team to work with. Working with existing resources, um, our department org chart is as followed. Starting with business services, um, led by Maria Calcaterra, this division has taken on two departments and is doing an outstanding job for both. Mary Lou Stevens is leading our arts and special events team, uh, Don Prince, family and youth services, uh, Karen Imig is community assistance, and code compliance is Jack Strout. And we have a vacant management assistant um, position that we will be filling pretty soon. Um, this makes up our amazing team, and we and I can't say amazing enough. I just want to stress that. Um, they are making the department what the department needs to be. Um, so to do our job, you have given us um, a FY20 operating budget of about $15 million, along with 44 FTEs and 196 part-time seasonal positions, all of whom are rocking some superior public service for Peoria. Now, let's take a diver deep into our divisions. All right, I'll start off with the Community Assistant Division. As we said, they came over from our Community Development, is headed by Karen Imeg. Uh, they have the responsibility of more of the human service needs and revitalization efforts for the city. In particular, they manage our Community Development Block Grant, which is an entitlement funds we receive from HUD uh, to serve the low to moderate income populations. Uh, we get about 850,000 a year in funding to meet about 1.6 million in need and requests that we receive each year. Predominantly that's used to do affordable housing development, our emergency home repair program, and some public facility enhancements. We also receive from HUD some home funds, about 250,000. We receive those through the, the uh, county consortium, and that goes wholly towards uh, affordable housing development, utilizing Habitat for Humanity. Uh, 
In the near future, you should be able to see on the northeast corner of 85th Avenue in Madison, some ground disturbance as Habitat is going to put in four single family infill homes there, uh, and we look to see the dirt moving near future. They're also expressed interest in the vacant lot to the west across 85th, so we're hopeful they'll be able to do some more great work that they've done there in other neighborhoods in, in Peoria. Uh, they also administer our general fund grant. Those just came through our subcommittee uh, where we received $384,000 in needs and requests, and we were able to fund $241,000 through 32 different nonprofit agencies that are out there serving our Peoria community. Uh, human services, most notable is um, Peoria Support, where they uh, program, where they do uh, education series with our nonprofit partnerships. Uh, they do our resource guide uh, and education classes and referrals. Uh, our resource center, um, uh, Debbie Pearson was just here uh, uh, an agenda ago telling all the great things that we're doing at the resource center, in particular with the expansion and the addition of nine to ten new communities and human service agencies that will start the work in July. We have a grand opening already scheduled for June 27th. It should be on all your calendars. We're very excited for these services to start providing, uh, these agencies start providing services Monday through Fridays, eight to five, um, in that shared space or on Saturdays by appointment. The group also provides homeowner association classes and administers our neighborhood grants program, which is about $150,000. Um, those uh, are going to be revamped. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. So we're broader serving uh, the greater neighborhood community as we do more engagement with those communities. Family and Youth Services is made up of several divisions to continually meet the needs of our residents. We offer drop-in and licensed child care, programs for teens, active adults. We have summer camps, before and after care, during the school year. Our community-wide AMPM program, which is our before and after school program, is located at 22 of the Peoria Unified Elementary Schools, with a current enrollment of about 2,200 participants. We also provide a Little Learner program, which is an all-day preschool program, at our Sunrise Family Center, which is located on Sunrise Mountain Campus, with about 145 little ones enrolled in that particular program. I'd like to take a minute to highlight our value partnership with Peoria Unified School District we continue to leverage our resources together to better serve our residents, which again ties back to our mission statement of creating a sense of community and pride. Traditionally, we have provided our AMPM program in a public school setting. As the needs of our community changes, you have been on the forefront of those needs. Through the budget process, you approved a new partnership with the Academy of Math and Science Charter School. New to our city, through this partnership, we will provide our AMPM program starting the end of July of 2019 to an underserved part of Peoria. As part of our mission of creating a sense of community and pride, the community center is front and center. With our vast programming offering, as Paula Considine presented just a few short weeks ago, uh, we were able to create that sense of community each and every day. Programming at the community center includes our active adult program, our adaptive program, as well as our group supported employment, just to name a few. All provide opportunities to engage our community members. One partnership I would like to highlight is our partnership with Cibola Vista Resort, located in the northern area of Peoria. Cibola Vista staff wanted to find ways to engage their visitors on vacation. This term, volunteerism, has been incorporated into the resort as an option of, for guests to partake in. Our first event included 20 tourists volunteering at the Special Olympic event. It was incredible. The idea of engaging tourists while on vacation is just another way we are engaging on so many levels. Our Youth Advisory Board, advising to you, Mayor and Council, um, on youth-related topics, along with our two youth liaisons, continue to shine in so many ways. We will be presenting an update in August to highlight all the great things the Youth Advisory Board has accomplished over the past year, along with a few suggestions to retool the program. Now, let's talk about arts and special events. As you know, Vice Mayor and Council, our city is a place where arts, art, arts and special events are celebrated, appreciated, and supported. Arts and special events are relevant to the livability of our community. With that said, we want to ensure that our arts action plan is meeting the needs of our community. We are very excited to be working through this process with our Arts Commission for the upcoming fiscal year. 
The process will be finalized at our August Arts Commission meeting. As I shared earlier, our city is the place that for arts, the arts are celebrated, appreciated, and supported. We are doing this in so many ways, two of which I'd like to highlight, our Old Town Intersection painting and the Influx program. We have developed a sense of place in Old Town Peoria, where we recently completed five painted intersections. The artists all included members of the community, including high school students who helped complete the painting projects. We received valley-wide coverage on TV in the Arizona Republic, AZ Central, as well as local media. Our Facebook and Instagram profiles have been getting more and more attention and followers. If you're not already a follower, please check out Peoria AZ Arts and, and Events on our Facebook and Instagram. The Influx program is a strategic partnership of now six organizations, including Chandler, Gilbert, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, and Tempe. The program was launched by the, the Scottsdale's Public Arts in 2010 as an initiative for temporary installation of vacant storefronts. This initiative have continued to expand and gain momentum since its inception, increasing the positive impact on the local communities and the Arizona artists. The multi-city temporary art program launched its art tour on April 27th, 2019, on International Sculpture Day. The art tour included Phoenix, Glendale, Peoria, Chandler, Tempe, Scottsdale, and was a huge success. Peoria received two temporary art sculptures, one in each library, which will be on display until April of 2020. We are excited about this new art program that gives emergent artists the opportunity to be part of public art on a smaller scale and to learn the process. The program also connects Peoria to the greater Phoenix metropolitan area as a destination for public art and has had an attractive place for artists to create. Not too long ago, Vice Mayor and Council, we presented a review of special events. We spoke of five areas where that, that really um, meets, the, that will really make an impact, sorry, excuse me, in our community. Accessible and affordable, education and culture, place making, neighborhood centric, and tourism. These categories fit perfectly with our department mission and vision. As such, we've been researching a variety of different types of elements for a fresh look to our citywide special events. We are so excited of the approval from you, Vice Mayor and Council, on the opportunity to create a new signature event in Peoria. We want to say thank you to all of you. We have secured a consultant to assist with this process and we'll be hearing from the consultant later this month. We will set up meetings to discuss this in the near future. Code compliance, as I said before, new location, new name, new uniforms, new mission and vision. So a quick reminder, they have a very tough job, and I think all of you would know that, uh, and it resonates daily. Uh, and in that, I just a quick reminder, the role of code enforcement uh, compliance is to balance the community value and expectations with that of private property. That's always the, the civil issues we have between complainant and uh, alleged violator. So the council over time has instituted these high property standards, which I highly respect and value. And these have been based on community desires and input over the years. In fact, we're in the process of modifying code amendment recommendations right now uh, through the ad hoc code review subcommittee, co-chaired by council members Finn and Patena. Uh, and what, those are out for public comment right now on our website. The recommended changes uh, are primarily housekeeping and administrative in nature. And as the process showed, we already have a very good code in writing. I think it was a good educational process. We provided uh, the work group uh, as well as the community input we received. And we had a couple of community hearings. Um, really, it's working very well. Uh, also, you may uh, recognize that the Neighborhood Pride program up there. And I want to thank those council members who come out and helped us with that. And this is, program has been running about 25 years. And, I want to thank council members who helped institute it years ago. Uh, this program is a revitalization program out in the neighborhoods uh, and tends to be in the harder hit, older parts of town that have higher needs. Uh, we go out and in October spend a Saturday with a large volunteer group uh, and as well as donors who provide uh, funds and rock and 
uh, paint. And so between our program and those volunteers, we go out and touch about a couple dozen homes where we landscape and paint these houses, give them a new look and feel, instantly revitalize that neighborhood. Uh, and then we continue to work with them from an engagement to sustain that look and feel. We go back in February to touch up and add some houses that were a little bit in disbelief when we were out there in the fall, uh, and they saw the great work we did and want to piggyback on that. Uh, as a side note, this program, yeah, we're up for a, fin we're a finalist in uh, Neighborhood USA, uh, Best Neighborhood Program Awards category next week in uh, Palm Springs, so wish us luck. So how are we going to do this? We have a new department, new mission and vision. Uh, where do we go from here? Before we go into where we go exactly from here, I want to transition kind of from where we've been. This year, we try to make our mark, especially in the human services area, and we piggybacked on the Peoria identity and branding. Peoria is the place. And I know I've been using this as my signature in my email. Peoria is a place where need meets kindness. And we've seen that in a lot of things we've done with the expansion of the Community Resource Center, uh, working with our collaborative areas of town, uh, western cities, to do a more of a collaborative regional homeless approach, uh, expansion of uh, the Resource Center and the services being provided there, uh, and our homeless uh, recommendations that we hope you know, you'll consider in the upcoming budget to better address homeless issues, both regionally and in Peoria. Uh, but we, we, we wanted to go back to, again, the input we received, 360 feedback that we constantly we want to uh, adhere to, uh, policymakers and stakeholders alike. And uh, we've also found that Peoria is the place where residents connect. And we really want to focus our efforts going forward on uh, not just the, the, the human service side, but the neighborhood services side. And so what does that look like? Um, and how are we going to do that? Kelly? Okay, well, we're going to start with what we have learned um, from you, Council, um, the community, and staff, again represented in this word cloud. So many times we get focused on our day-to-day -day business, and while we, are, while we continue to run our department like a business and have our eye on our fiscal responsibility, we spoke with staff and stakeholders and feel we need to shift our thinking, have a new attitude to ROE, which equals return on engagement. We will do this by focusing on our ROE. We believe we can and we will yield a positive return on plan engagement, particularly by using some new engagement tools, um, like the neighborhood pop-up meetings that seek the interest, to, that seek to increase diversity and participation in our neighborhoods. The block uh, party trailer, where we'll bring the party to your neighborhood and offer a time bank where organizations can barter or exchange services amongst each other. Now, identifying multi-year objectives and goals and keys to success over time is a necessary, expected, and will weigh heavily on our ability to successfully meet the ever-changing and diverse set of needs of Peoria community. To help us to do that and stay true to our mission and vision, we have structured a five-year, five to six-year approach that is iterative and built upon itself. So what we hope to do in the very short term, the next one or two years, is organize a group of neighborhood-based organizations and connect them with each other. Uh, then over the course of the, of the third and fourth year, we, we want to bring them together, train them, and build their capacity in order to gain access to needed resources and be able to help themselves. And by the fifth and sixth years, we hope we have highly functioning neighborhood organizations, but we need to figure out how to sustain that. So let's go into some of the details. So the first two years, we're talking about organizing these neighborhood organizations. Uh, we want to do that through a series of community engagement. Uh, we already started that some this year. Kelly talked about the pop-up meetings, some of the open houses and town halls. Uh, council member Dunn, you talked about wanting to do a uh, coffee with a council member meeting. We'd love to help you arrange that. I know others have done similar ones. We want to we want to be there when you're meeting with your constituents. We've recently found very high success in getting input and feedback and engagement with uh, residents when they're already going to a function. So if you already have something sc scheduled that they're gonna come to, we wanna be there. We wanna be there to assist you, to assist the neighborhood and liaison in between them and even other departments. Um, we wanna expand, obviously we talked about the expansion of the community operations through the resource center expansion uh, and its services being provided there. Uh, Kelly talked about the charter school, AMPM school that we're branching out to to reach those harder to reach schools. Time Bank is a new one that we look to really understand and how we can engage with neighborhoods through that. Now, social service issues, no, no bounds, you know, and with a lot of the West City, uh, we inter 
interact. Uh, our boundaries are just here and there with smaller cities and narrow in some points. Uh, and so we, we've been exercising a collaborative approach working with West Valley Human Services Collaborative around social issues currently mostly focused on the homeless, but it, it's all social issues that will, will touch us. Uh, and so, as I said before, we have some requests in the budget uh, that we hope you'll uh, consider uh, reaching around homeless outreach and navigation, uh, not just for our city, but we want to do it collaboratively with the others because we think we're going to have much higher success if we're all adopting the same principles and policies, as well as funding for emergency shelter programs, which uh, is going to be needed in order to really uh, move, the, move the needle. And lead with services, obviously, and that's so important. And again, any neighborhood-centric special events that are, or projects that we have, either other departments, we want to be there. We don't want to just be there with collateral on the table. We want to be in front of the table engaging with and introducing, getting to know our Peoria neighborhoods, hopefully getting, and Kelly talked to some um, resources we need so we can store those contacts that we make and connect them to each other. So, uh, and then, I'm sorry, one key role we just added, you know, the census 2020 is coming up. Uh, we've been asked to help with the neighborhood outreach on a very important uh, census coming up. You know, every, every resident needs to be counted. It translates to programs and services those residents receive. So we're going to help with that outreach and especially some important changes this year, particularly uh, not just the mail-in, but people will be able to submit their response online or through call-in. So we're going to help with that. Our internal organization efforts will include um, creating a public engagement and neighborhood resource task force, similar to our internal homeless team, which includes public safety, community assistance, code compliance, park rangers, and so many other internal departments. We want to expand our contact database beyond the 225 HOAs and the 150 non-HOAs geographically representing Peoria. Add contact info beyond the property uh, management managements on the HOAs, which have very limited homeowner information. We want to change the name of our database to Rainbow, Rep a residents and neighborhoods based organization contact database. The goal is to educate and outreach neighborhood based organizations throughout the year and add to our database. Staff training is imperative since we must since we have so many new staff to engagement in outreach and education. Creating a neighborhood ombudsman so neighborhood leaders can call, contact a live person, similar to the business ombudsman with the Economic Development Department. So the first couple of years we're organizing, we're gonna get a group of them. As I said before, it's gonna be an iterative process. We're gonna do this year over year. Uh, so we're gonna take them through. Next, we have to build their capacity, right? We have to train them to bring them in. Um, we want to use uh, neighborhood and leadership training, uh, do assessments, some SWOT analysis, maybe some asset mapping. They need access and connection to resources and information in order to, so we can help them and help themselves uh, better meet the needs of their neighborhood. Uh, we want to complement uh, the current Peoria placemaking efforts we have and maybe tailor to some localized neighborhood placemaking. Uh, we want to be able to revamp those neighborhood grants into some My Neighborhood grants that are going to have a more of a Peoria-centric or one Peoria theme to it uh, and neighborhood engagement. Um, we also know a membership on the MAG uh, board, Continuum of Care and others, is so important to accessing funding that's not readily available to us right now. And so we appreciate the, the roles many of you play on a lot of the MAG. We want to be on the, on the bureaucratic side trying to get it. Uh, the West Valley just got a seat at the table, and we know how important it is to have a seat at the table when they're making the funding decisions. So we're going to aggressively pursue that over the year because Peoria deserves a seat at the table. Uh, we also want to look at new volunteer programs where our neighborhood-based organizations can access them to help uh, their own project needs. Continuing internally by building capacity, we want to create a neighborhood GIS layers. We want to procure a constituent management system, and we'd like to see grant or funding um, for our neighborhood engagement vehicles and trailers. Once this is off the ground, we'll want to be appropriately resourced to add and train new neighborhood engagement staff along with existing staff. All right, so we got a group of them. We, we organized them, we trained them, they're operating high engaged. How do we sustain that? So we need to connect them 
to needed resources to sustain that, so to keep nourishing and encouraging those types of behaviors. To do that, we're looking for some aspirational uh, tools for them, i.e. an integration of social media and where they're participating. They're highly engaged with each other, their own membership, as well as with other neighborhoods. We wanna look to pulling from our uh, training program and identifying some key neighborhood quality of life champions who can be models for their community as well as get together with others, maybe create an alumni group of them. Uh, whereas the capacity building phase was kind of teach them to fish, the sustainability is we want to teach them to teach, kind of train the trainer kind of thing. So they might come back through certain organizations. They can also uh, help with some community cooperatives where we got, and the mayor mentioned in her, say the city, you know, uh, people helping people and neighbors helping neighbors. This would be more neighborhoods helping neighborhoods. Uh, and we think we can help ourselves help them in that regard. They can also see a role in possible citizen commission on neighborhoods where they can help us and guide us through some decision making to better meet their neighborhood needs. Our healthy neighborhood goals are being achieved and we want these successes and our engagement efforts to have a role in meeting their needs. We can incorporate data being collected and use it systematically to help make livability driven decisions um, for our Peoria neighborhoods through Promatically and CIP planning. So from hence we came through what we aspire to do through our mission and vision, our multi-year themes and objectives and our healthy neighborhood initiatives. We hope to ultimately expand and use our neighborhood and human services and Peoria branding statements to help our community and staff know who we are and how we intend to make our mark. After all, we are a place where need meets kindness, support and resources, where cultures, characteristics and communities are honored and where safety and cleanliness are a source of community pride. I know we didn't give you many opportunities to provide input. It was pretty fast paced. I uh, apologize for that, but how are we doing? Are we hitting the mark? Anything we missed that we can add? Anything we can answer? I'm just dumbfounded. You have done so much work and made so much progress in so many areas, <clears throat> excuse me, since this was revamped last July. It's unbelievable, I have a whole page full of notes here. Um, I just think it's amazing. You've touched so many aspects of human life and community life and what we want our city to be and how we want our residents to feel. I, I just think it's, it's amazing. You guys are really doing a job. And uh, I just look forward to getting down into the highways and byways and, and engaging the community members. So, because what I see happening is taking it from city direction down into the place where it's gonna catch fire and keep growing. We can't always be going into those communities and fixing problems or they, they've got to embrace it so that they continue to do it themselves. I'm just really excited about what I've seen. And once again, I wonder if you could put a copy of this online so we can okay. have it to study. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments from the council? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Chris, I think uh, I think this was a great presentation. I certainly think you're on on, on the right path. I just have a, a few comments. Um, many years ago, in the Human Services Division, we were under Community Services, and they were sort of the dominant part of that the, that department, as they should have been. And then we got moved to Community Development, and uh, we kind of were still in the garage, uh, you know, with our division and. <clears throat> Finally, with the new Neighborhood Human Services Department, we've moved from the garage into the kitchen and we have a seat at the table now. And so I think this is a really big deal. Um, you touch, this, this department touches so many people uh, through your neighborhood pride, through grants, uh, working with the not-for-profits, and now the, the Resource Center. You know, we're a city of 175,000 people we're a big city now, and we're, we're, we're really acting like a big city now by addressing all the needs of, uh, of, of our citizens, and I, I think that's a, a really good thing. You know, you include neighborhood pride, arts and special events, CDBG, human service, home money, general fund money, code compliance, all part of your department. 
And I think now it's finally the right mix. Uh, again, we're no longer in the garage. We're, we're back, we're at the table now. And, and uh, you have a meaningful department. You're addressing city needs, uh, citizens' needs, and I'm really, really delighted with that. So uh, I, th I think you're on the right path, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. No, you guys are definitely on the right path. Uh, my only suggestion is um, would you please include youth when you're doing community outreach? Make sure that you're, when you're doing these, these road shows and these pop-up events, making sure that you're getting with our youth advisory group and reaching out to the schools, because uh, we talked about this a couple of years ago, Jeff, uh, doing some block, you know, block parties at the schools during lunch period, and it never really kicked off with the school district. This is a perfect opportunity to get that uh, revived again and, and moving forward. So again, you definitely are on the right track. Thank you. Um, I would say, too, I love all of it. Fantastic presentation. Um, so much has happened in the last year. And um, I know from my perspective with the Mesquite District, one component of so many that you talked about, which great things happening, is you know taking services on the road because there are no facilities in the Mesquite District. And I think that that has been, I know that has been so effective in our community and I thank you for that and all of the work that you're doing and what what I really got out of your presentation is what council member Patena said how there's just so much connection you've touched on so many things but even within the city and the different departments involved in bringing this to fruition um, and how the presentation is making its way into our city is tremendous. So everyone um, has had a little piece of this and is affecting our citizens in a great way. So thank you so much for your presentation. And with that, we are adjourned until our seven o'clock meeting. Great job.
the mayor and city council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council Chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. Peoria Council meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Clerk, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Binsbacher. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Here. Council Member Patena. Here. Council Member Finn. Here. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Member Dunn. Here. Council Liaison Johnson. Here. And Council Liaison Gilbertson. Here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City of Peoria Council meeting of May 7th, 2019. The first item on the agenda this evening is a certificate of appointments to newly appointed boards and commission members. Uh, may I have Council Member Patena please join me at the front? Thank you. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. It's always nice to see a full chamber. Um, we want to acknowledge this evening our board and commission members, new board and commission members, and welcome them to the city of Peoria. We thank you for your uh, continued service and support. And I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Patena uh, to present the award. Thank you, Vice Mayor. As the uh, uh, Vice Mayor said, we are always happy to welcome new recruits to our boards and commissions. Right now we have uh, over 100 people that serve on our boards and commissions and over 20 boards and commissions that are available for any of you to join. We appreciate the fact that you give your uh, uh, time to the city of Peoria. Without all of your efforts, we wouldn't be able to run the city the way we run it, so we, we appreciate it. So when I call your name, will you please come up and get your certificate? To the Arts Commission, Kathy Connect. To the Citizens Commission on Salaries for Elected City Officials, one of my favorite, uh, Christina Huff. To the Design Review Board, Gary Nelson.
to the Youth Advisory Board, Peter Bartos. To the Youth Advisory Board, Kaylin Johnson. <laughs> to the Youth Advisory Board, Madison Presmick. Youth Advisory Board, Dominique Van Winkle. <laughs> and once again to the Youth Advisory Board, Addison Vink. Congratulations and thank you all. Okay, moving on to the next item on the agenda is a presentation acknowledging the winners of this year's Constitution Contest. I want to uh, take a minute to just say a few things about the uh, Celebrate the Constitution contest. This is the 19th year that this has happened in the city of Peoria. And the purpose of the, con the Constitution contest is to promote an understanding of the United States Constitution to school aged children. It's very important. Uh, the Celebrate the Constitution contest is sponsored by the city of Peoria, but we want to acknowledge our partnership with the Peoria Unified School District. It definitely takes the, the partnership and collaboration between our two organizations to make it happen. So at this time, I would like to call our council liaisons, Frank Johnson and Leah Gilbertson, down to the front to do this presentation. Thank you again to each of the students who have participated in the cel and celebrate the Constitution Contest. At this time, we will be calling students in groups based on grades. When you hear your name, please come down to receive your certificate and prize. We're going to start with kindergarten, first, and second grade categories. In the kindergarten category, first place from Desert Harbor Elementary, Jacob Chadwick. In the first and second grade category, first place from Oasis Elementary, Matthew Eastman. <laughs> second place from Desert Harbor Elementary, Victoria Cox. <laughs> Third place from Skyview Elementary, Aaliyah Donahue.
In the third and fourth grade category, first place from Oakwood Elementary, Milana Adenroth. Second place from Lake Pleasant Elementary, Jaden Hormon. Third place from Apache Elementary, Logan Woodward. In the fifth and sixth grade category, first place from Apache Elementary, Walbert Bellman. <laughs> Second place from Apache Elementary, Tuscan Zahn. <laughs> Third place from Apache Elementary, Holden Woodward. In the seventh and eighth grade category, first place from Oasis Elementary, Vincent Lee. Second place from Peoria Elementary, Rylan Ramsey. Third place from Apache Elementary, Xavier Barbour. In the ninth and 10th grade category, first place from Peoria High School, Aruzu Sabir. <laughs> Second place from Peoria High School, Marissa Vasquez. <laughs> Third place from Peoria High School, Kelsey Ramos. In the 11th and 12th grade category, first place from Sunrise Mountain High School, Gage Zahn. <laughs> Second place from Sunrise Mountain High School, Hannah Johnson. <laughs> Third place from Peoria High School, Suzanne Bigelow. And the grand prize winner from Centennial High School, Amber Cash. Congratulations to all the winners, and thank you all once again for participating in this program.
Okay, can you hear me? Great. Okay, well, I'm sorry that you kids didn't get to have your picture taken with the mayor and you had to settle for me. Um, but I tell you, I know that she is always so proud to be part of any of these events with our youth, and I'm honored to try to fill her shoes in any way this evening. So congratulations to all of you. Um, at this time, it's that time of year where we acknowledge our youth liaisons and the work, the tremendous work that they do uh, for the city of Peoria and more importantly to represent the youth. They are the voice of the youth and they serve um, as part of our city council. They don't vote, but they sit at the dais. They attend study sessions and different meetings and it is a great opportunity. So any of you kids could apply for that opportunity. So look for that. Um, at this time, I want to call Dawn Prince up here so that she can speak to the program and speak to these amazing individuals. Thank you so much for all you've done this year, and we know you're going to go on to do great things. Here you go, Dawn. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very proud, and we here at the City of Peoria are very proud of the Youth Council Liaison Program. Um, so the purpose of this program is to allow high school students to sit on the dais with our city council and to essentially provide a voice for the youth in matters impacting our city. Um, youth council liaisons attend both city council study sessions and council meetings and learn all the ins and outs of city business through various means. Some of these means could include receiving and reviewing that huge council meeting packet, which they get every two weeks. Um, the, they also have had one-on-one uh, -on -one target meetings with some of our different city staff just to talk about what the city does, and then also experiencing um, things through visiting our city departments. All of this helps to provide them an understanding of the issues so that they're able to participate in the, in the conversations at the council meetings. Um, this is actually the sixth year that we've had this program, and to date, we have had 12 amazing youth come and sit with our council on the dais. Um, to become a youth liaison, as the vice mayor said, students must be an active member of the youth advisory board, so definitely look on our website and um, look for that application. And um, each year, two students are selected to participate in the capacity of youth council liaison. Um, this year's youth, uh, Leah and Frank, have done a great job representing their peers, and I'm very proud for all they've accomplished, and I'm very proud to have seen them through this process. Just to give you a little bit of information about the things that they've accomplished, I want to talk about Leah first. She's been on the Youth Advisory Board since 2018. She is the Vice Chair of the Youth Advisory Board, has attended and supported numerous events, including the National League of Cities City Summit in Los Angeles. She's also, she's done all of these things while being a member of the National Honor Society and International Baccalaureate program participant, an FDA youth tobacco inspector, and she also sits on the superintendent's youth advisory board for the Deer Valley School District. She is going to be a senior at Barry Goldwater High School next year, and she wants to be a trauma surgeon. So Leah, thank you so much for your service. Okay. Now on to Frank. Frank has been on the, oh, that's a picture. All right, picture's fine. Okay, on to Frank. Frank has been on the Youth Advisory Board since 2016. He's an active member of the Youth Advisory Board, and he's also intended and supported numerous events through the including the National League of Cities City Summit in Los Angeles and the Leadership Institute in Washington, D.C. He's been a senator at the Youth and Government Model Legislative Conference, and he has attended the Fleischer Scholarship Program at ASU. He's a member of Creative Theater Troupe, is in the process of acting in three short films, and is a guitarist in an online band. He also is graduating and will be attending Arizona State University in the fall, where he has received a full ride scholarship. Congratulations. Wow.
Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, the consent agenda. These are items listed on the agenda with a C. They have been considered routine by the city council or previously addressed by the council. They will be passed with one motion unless a member of the council requests one to be removed from the consent agenda. Council, are there any items you would like to be removed from the agenda? Seeing none, do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Please vote. And it is unanimous. Okay, moving on to the regular agenda. Uh, the next item is 19R, item 19R, property acquisition, 83rd Avenue and Jefferson Street. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. We have Scott White, our real estate development officer that will provide a presentation on this action item. Thank you. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be before you tonight. Uh, the item before you tonight is the acquisition of property uh, in Old Town, Peoria, <laughs> in the vicinity of 83rd Avenue and Jefferson Street. Um, it's uh, proximate to the, uh, the community center, uh, Grand Avenue, uh, Suna Park, the Washington Street block. That has been the uh, area of interest for uh, past land acquisitions uh, for the city, as well as uh, Axiom Church, uh, Wilhelm Otto. Um, Specifically, we're looking at a uh, consideration of five properties um, that uh, comprise about 19,600 square feet, uh, including a 5,200 square foot commercial building. Um, this is a, a key corner um, in the Old Town area. Um, and we're looking at a, a total acquisition cost of $281,525, um, comprised of uh, the value of a appraised value plus 10%, um, including closing costs uh, at $278,000. Uh, we're looking at a uh, one-time estimate for trash cleanup and weed removal on an annual basis of $1,525. Uh, one-time estimate for facility maintenance of $2,000 uh, to get us to the uh, grand total of $281,525. This is part of the ongoing land acquisition program in Old Town um, in furtherance of uh, Old Town revitalization efforts. Um, in terms of the purpose for the acquisition, it's initially the, for the purpose of land banking uh, for the future attraction of targeted end users, uh, consistent with our Old Town uh, re uh, revitalization documents as well as current economic development efforts. Um, and certainly looking for uh, Old Town revitalization uh, to increase uh, business attraction and investment opportunities, um, but starting with land assembly um, and the recently uh, completed uh, Old Town development concept process. Um, so with that, I'll try and answer any questions you might have. Council, any questions or comments? Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Thank you, Scott, for that presentation. Uh, this is a great opportunity. This is a huge investment in Old Town. We've been working for many years on this and assembling property and uh, this is just another really huge key piece that will help us add to our inventory so that when we're ready to grow up out of the ground, we'll have that space to do it. I um, strongly concur with your uh, opportunity here. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Please vote. And it is unanimous. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item 20R, a minor general plan amendment and rezoning uh, the Bella Pasa project on 75th Avenue and Acoma Drive. Great. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And we have Chris Hawkins, our planning director, will provide a presentation. Thank you. 
Good evening, Vice Mayor, members of the council. Um, item uh, 20R, this is a minor general plan amendment and a rezone filed by Reese Anderson with Pew and Lake on behalf of the home builder. The home builder in this case is Bella Floor Communities. Uh, this application pertains to a 10.97-acre uh, site located at the southwest corner of 75th Avenue and Acoma Drive. It's indicated in red on the screen above. Um, as you may recall, this site is uh, formerly operated as a commercial wholesale nursery by the Kendall family. So the proposal tonight, um, if approved, would facilitate the development of a 30-lot single-family residential community to be called Bella Passa. Okay, so again, there are two requests tonight. So at the end of the public hearing, we'll ask for two separate actions. But the first request is a minor general plan amendment, and the uh, request is to redesignate the property from a state density residential, zero to two units per acre, to low density residential, or two to five units per acre. And then the companion case is a rezone, to rezone it from its current planned area development as a wholesale nursery to a brand new planned area development uh, for a 30 lot community. Um, as you know, a planned area development is a tailored type of zoning district. Every planned area different, uh, development is different, uh, but it oper offers the opportunity for staff, the applicant, and the neighboring community to identify tailored standards that, that not only respond to the context, but maybe some of the concerns in the area so we can adjust the standards within the PAD document. This graphic illustrates the site in the area context. Um, the site identified in red, again, that's the subject site, the existing wholesale nursery. That's a plant nursery that's been in uh, operation since 1980, which is when they began operations. So looking at the surrounding site, I'll start from the north and go clockwise. Um, the north, to the north is Thunderbird uh, North, which consists of one acre lots within an unincorporated um, Maricopa County area pocket. Uh, to the east, across 75th Avenue, um, is another pocket of unincorporated Maricopa County, but it consists uh, of a nonprofit known as Soldier's Best Friend. They work with veterans groups, along with uh, a Methodist church that's directly to the south of, uh, of that operation. Looking south of the existing site is Thunderbird Vista. Uh, this consists of more traditional single-family residential lots. Uh, lot sizes uh, range from 8,000 square foot lots to the northern edge, which are around 11 to 12,000 square foot lots that abut the existing site along the southern boundary. And then to the west, this is an area of, uh, within the city of Peoria that consists of half acre lots and larger. So given the, uh, uh, the wide range of uses and lot size along with the site position along 75th Avenue, 75th Avenue is a major arterial roadway, a four lane major arterial roadway, and Acoma, which is a collector in the county, uh, operated by Maricopa County, um, one could argue that a residential, residential community in this would be a, uh, consist of transitional size lots and it might be appropriate to the context. We'll talk about that in a minute uh, along the analysis part. Okay, the graphic on the screen um, illustrates the currently proposed development plan. So Bella Pasa, this is a gated residential community consisting of 30 single family homes. So the corresponding gross density for this is 2.73 units per acre. All homes within this development are all limited to single story. There's a stipulation also in the ordinance that, that specifies that. Uh, the entry will be at 75th Avenue. Uh, that's the primary entry. There's going to be a fire access that will, uh, that's available at Acoma Drive on the northwest corner of the site. Lot sizes within this uh, PAD range from 8,030 square feet to the largest at 11,811 square feet. Uh, with lots with a minimum lot width of 70 feet wide up to 100 feet deep is the minimum depth of that. Again, uh, to promote compatibility, the lots along the southern boundary, um, uh, they will range between 10,000 and near 12,000 square feet in size to, to uh, be appropriately uh, compatible with the community to the south. In terms of uh, open space, there's going to be two open space areas. So if you look at the 75th Avenue entry, that will direct you to a um, large, to an activity area in the middle and that will consist of a uh, Ramada play area and a shaded pavilion. And then there's a secondary amenity at the southwest corner of the site, which is a turfed uh, area for um, passive, um, passive and, and active recreation there. Um, as part of this development, the developer required to dedicate additional right-of-way to accommodate a 65-foot half street along 75th Avenue and provide curb, gutter, sidewalk, and street lights. Along a coma, which again is a county roadway, um, they're required to dedicate and install improvements in accordance with county requirements. I, I will say to maintain the semi-rural feel of the area, um, there will be no sidewalk or streetlights in that area, and, and that's something the that neighbors have asked for during the, during the process. 
Now from a traffic perspective, um, the site again will be accessed from 75th Avenue. Uh, the gate for queuing has enough space for at least two vehicles, which meets our standards. Uh, I will indicate that the, the specific location of the driveway is subject to some refinement. Again, as we look at the preliminary plat, if this moves on, we'll look at how it aligns with areas to the east to make sure we have, we have safe uh, distances. Um, given the small number of units, the uh, development is not required to have a secondary access, although they will, they will have a fire access at the northwest corner. Um, as part of this application, uh, the city did require the applicant to have a traffic impact, impact statement prepared by a registered uh, uh, traffic engineer. So the traffic statement was prepared based on our criteria and, and looked at existing and proposed conditions in the study area, including areas in the, in, in the vicinity. The results and recommendations of that traffic statement were then reviewed by our traffic engineering division. Uh, they concluded that the traffic impact created by Bella Passa is sustainable by the current traffic conditions, meaning the low trip generation and the low number of units um, that the existing facility, uh, roadway facilities in the area were, um, uh, were, uh, could accommodate that traffic impact and did not, uh, the study did not recommend additional traffic modifications. For example, did not recommend a right turn lane for southbound traffic on 75th Avenue. That right turn lane did not meet traffic warrants as part of that traffic statement. Okay, so I'll show you some of the imagery. Um, what we're looking at here on this graphic, this is that central amenity area as you come into the project from 75th Avenue. Again, uh, Ramada play area, shaded pavilion area. There's another graphic that shows you the development plan, the walls. Um, the style design of the walls is trying to pay homage to the semi-rural uh, feel of the area. So that's what you'll see indicated there. And this graphic, this next one, is more thematic details um, of the wall treatments around Bella Passa. Okay, on the left, that's the current general plan land use map. Uh, the site is currently designated as a state residential on the, with a corresponding density of zero to two units per acre, with a target density of one unit per acre. So this designation is typically areas that are semi-rural in nature and they support lots uh, exceeding 18,000 square feet. That's typically what that designation looks for. Um, in this case, the applicant is proposing to redesignate the site to low density residential, which is the darker yellow color to the south of the site. Um, that low density residential designation allows for two to five units per acre with a target of three units per acre. So with 30 lot development, they come in at 2.73 units per acre. They are slightly under the target for the proposed low density residential category. So this designation supports more of a suburban character with moderately sized lots, and generally between uh, eight to 12,000 square foot in size. Now, when you look at the graphic on the right, that's the zoning. So that's what we, that's what somebody could develop today. Uh, the site again is a, a planetary development for a nursery today. Um, areas to the south that are part of Thunderbird South are zoned both for R18, which is 8,000 square foot lots and R112, which is 12,000 square foot lots. Areas to the west, I'll note, that even though they're designated the state residential on the general plan, they are zoned for R112 and R118. Again, R112 is probably uh, a, a more of a, a closer correlation with the low density residential or the darker yellow category. And then areas to the north that are currently in the county and areas to the east in the county are designated as state density residential uh, category. So we believe this is an area of, of transition with a variety of lot sizes. Uh, we believe that those factors coupled with its position adjacent to 75th Avenue, which is a major arterial roadway, um, we believe it invites consideration as a, not only as a transitional property, but also um, for a uh, increase in the designation. However, it's important that uh, we pay special consideration to the, some of the design parameters and some of the compatibility factors. So as I get into the public uh, review portion of it, we'll talk about some of the adjustments that were made to the, uh, com the um, conceptual plan to address some of those, in those interests. As part of the minor general plan amendment and rezone process, we do require that when the application comes in, they, uh, we provide a notice of application and then before it goes to hearing, a notice of hearing, and we mail that to all owners within a 600 foot radius of the site and all registered HOAs within a one mile radius. It's also required to be uh, published in the paper and the site posted with our requirements. 
In this case, uh, when the applicant first approached the city for what we call a pre-application conference, so this is a uh, discussion with city staff about a concept, uh, we advised them that at that point that, you know, it's probably a good idea to go take a walk around the neighborhood, take the temperature, see what people think about the project. Uh, they did that uh, to their credit. So they walked around to uh, knock on the door of 72 properties, and you'll see on the screen uh, the response that they uh, got. Um, the comments that they got from this early survey are indicated in, on uh, Exhibit 10 in your agenda packet. So again, that process was a, elective, and it occurred prior to submittal of the application. So once the application formally came in, um, the process does require a neighborhood meeting. So a neighborhood meeting was held at Paseo Verde uh, Church on May 21st, and we had about 20 attendees there. And uh, there were a number of comments that I'll, I'll go through in a minute. Um, so they, they went through and made some adjustments and then came back and they had a second neighborhood meeting that was held in December, and there was approximately 17 attendees that uh, attended that meeting. So. What were the, some of the concerns that we heard from neighbors? Uh, one of the concerns, I guess I'll put them in four buckets. Probably the first one would be lot size. Uh, neighbors along Thunderbird, uh, Thunderbird Vista, which is along the community to the south of the project, they wanted to see the southern lots in this development to be more um, in alignment with what their lot sizes were. So their lot sizes were around 11, 12,000 square feet. They wanted to see some closer to that. Um, attendees from the county areas to the north uh, wanted to see lots that were more one acre. Some wanted to see the area as a park site. Um, so I'll show you in a minute some of the adjustments that were done to that, take that into account. There were also concerns with building heights. Um, I think attendees from the neighborhoods to the south and north all believed that they wanted to see the homes limited to one story in height, and that was an adjustment that the applicant made on it. Uh, there were concerns about property values. Uh, the applicants in the meeting talked about price points. From a zoning perspective, um, property values is not part of our, our consideration. Um, you know, when we look at physical impacts, they can certainly be um, evaluated. Uh, we can mitigate them and look to create uh, better compatibility. But when you talk about property values, they're often very subjective and very intangible and, and, and something that it's not easily uh, reviewed or part of the uh, review criteria. And then there are also concerns about traffic congestion, namely, uh, none of the residents on the north in the county wanted any access along Acoma Drive and, and also along with that process, uh, Maricopa County Department of Transportation also indicated their non-support for access from Acoma um, aligning with the citizens in that, in that area. And there were also uh, general concerns about uh, traffic congestion along 85th Avenue, or 75th Avenue rather. So let's look at the uh, evolution of the case here. So what you're looking at on the left hand is the uh, site plan that came in uh, initially. So that shows an access point along a coma, which uh, enters into a, a main amenity area. There were 37 lots with that uh, existing application. Uh, the average lot size was about 6,700 square feet. Homes were both, both one and two story. And then after the uh, first neighborhood meeting, the uh, applicant uh, took into account all the concerns that they heard. They came back to the city with a revised site plan. Um, this is the, the site plan they showed the neighbors at the second neighborhood meeting, and that showed a reduction in the lot count to 30 units, so a corresponding reduction in the density. The lot sizes were increased, uh, and, and also particularly along the southern border, so those lot sizes will range between 10,000 and 12,000 square feet along the southern border. Lot sizes in the middle were also enlarged to uh, around 8,000 square feet, so overall the average lot size increased. And they also agreed to limit all lots on the property to one story uh, in height. And then finally, with uh, concerns about access, they um, uh, reintroduced a new access point at 75th Avenue. And so um, that would be the new access point. And as I indicated, the traffic study, was, the statement rather, was updated to reflect that new entry point. And uh, given the low number of units, uh, a um, further traffic restriction or enhancement was not required along southbound along 75th Avenue. So overall, in the public outreach process, um, outside of the neighborhood meetings, we did receive five emails in opposition. Uh, the concerns that were um, voiced in those emails and letters, uh, they're in your packet, but they, are, they align with kind of what we heard at the open house meetings in terms of those four topic areas. We, um, the applicant has been in contact with uh, Peoria Unified School District. They have met with them to talk about the project, and conceptually they have agreed to the terms of a developer assistance agreement, and with that, the school district has offered their, their support for the case. 
This item went before the Planning Commission on April 11th for a public hearing. Um, at that meeting, there were four speakers present from the general public. Uh, those four speakers um, uh, discussed concerns with the project, and again, they were all in the area of, uh, although some, some of the comments were appreciative of some of the adjustments, there were other concerns that uh, they still had concerns with traffic and, and, and lot size. Um, we did receive one email, and so when we look at the support and opposition, we got five emails prior to the first April meeting, and then we got one from same residents after the second meeting, and then as I indicated, a letter of support from uh, PUSD. So as we look at this, uh, app, these applications collectively, we believe that the amendment is, a, is an appropriate adjustment to the general plan. We believe it's in conformance, goals and objectives of the plan, and it will not adversely impact the surrounding area. As far as the rezone, we believe that the standards within the PAD have been carefully crafted to, uh, to promote compatibility within the area. Uh, we believe the design standards are, are in keeping with the overall character, uh, and the applicant has furnished a signed Proposition 207 waiver. So, Vice Mayor, members of the Council, with that, there are two actions this, night, this evening. The first action is a minor general plan amendment, and that is our recommendation is to approve Resolution 2019-68 to redesignate the site from low-density residential to, uh, actually it should say a state density residential to low density residential. I apologize for the, the error on the slide there. And then the second action should be a rezone to approve ordinance 2019-10 from planned area development that's a nursery to a planned area development of a 30 lot community and that's subject to conditions one through eight in your packet. And, and with that, I'll try to answer any questions you have. Thank you. So just to clarify, both of these items, though, fall under item 20R? Vice Mayor, that's correct, okay. but we, we will be asking for separate actions. Okay. So I have a speaker request, and it is from Sharon Hendrickson. You can approach the podium there, and please state your name and address for the clerk, and you have three minutes to speak. Can I? Uh, yes. Sharon Hendrickson, uh, 14354 North 76th Drive in Peoria, Arizona. And um, basically, to sum it up, make it short and sweet, please keep it at the estate density. Please don't change the zoning. Um, the people to the south of there have invested tremendous amounts of, of effort and sweat into keeping those uh, larger lots keeping them up and keeping that neighborhood up. Um, we also, at the last meeting, and I think this has really been glazed over and really just kind of just lost in the cracks somehow, we, we requested that the city of Peoria do a traffic density study, a full, fully done traffic study on 75th Avenue because there is a lot of concern about the, um, about the amount of inflow and outflow coming out of a 37 home additional housing area there. So we're very concerned about that. Um, I got some feedback from Lori Deaver at Planning and Zoning and she said, uh, oh, it, it was, uh, they were supposed to be, the, the traffic study is done by the client, by the applicant and I, I kind of scratched my head because how else could there any be anything but a positive, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, a positive result from the client doing a traffic study for a development that they want to put in? So what I'm just saying, and what other people in my area, and I can't speak for the five negative emails or the, the 13 that were undecided or the 40 that, you know, seem positive about it. I don't know anyone in my, my general neighborhood and my general building area that are happy about this. They're not. They're not one bit happy about this. And we feel like this has been kind of fast-tracked and there needs to be further study as to especially traffic and uh, just general population density in that area. And that's it. All right, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, any comments or questions from the council? No?
He's good. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so do I have a motion? Yes. We need to open the item up, uh, allow the applicant to speak, and then open it up to a public hearing. Oh, okay. So I declare this a public hearing. So this hearing is open, and is there anyone else here from the public that would like to address this issue? Seeing none, I declare this hearing closed. Council, comments, questions? Do we have a motion? I'll motion. Second. Please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item. Two different motions. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, on the second item, also part of item 20, uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Please vote. And that also passes unanimously. Okay, so we'll move along to item 21R, uh, adoption of tentative budget for fiscal year 2020. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And we have uh, Barry Haug, our Deputy Finance and Budget Director, will provide a presentation on the tentative budget. Great, thank you. All right. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Council. Tonight we're bringing forward the council approval for the fiscal year 2020 tentative budget. Uh, this is the first in a series of uh, steps for completing the formal adoption of the, the budget. As you're aware, the tentative budget sets, sets the maximum appropriation amount for the fiscal year. So developing a recommended budget uh, is a collaborative effort. It, can, it includes significant input from departments, uh, but also relies on and requires direction from city council. And these council priorities are the cornerstones for departments when they're developing their budgets. And throughout the year, council uh, has provided continued guidance, not just uh, during the budget process, but at many of the study sessions that you see here uh, that we had over the past year. These are in 2018, and then we had some in 2019 as well. And just a few weeks ago, Council had multiple budget study sessions where we discussed the operating and capital budgets for FY 2020. This slide outlines the key budget policy guidelines established in the Council adopted principles of sound financial management, and this sets the stage for developing the recommended budget. Each year we update the five-year long-range financial forecast that incorporates both revenue and expenditure estimates for all the city's major operating funds. This includes all revenues that are anticipated to be sustainable or recurring over the five-year forecast and the known or anticipating ongoing expenditure requirements. And then we make sure we have met all the reserve requirements. Anything above those reserve requirements we'll budget in the following year as one time. So here we are, the uh, fiscal year 2020 uh, budget. The proposed budget in summary totals $670 million. Uh, this re represents about a 1.5% increase over the prior year. The operating budget at 47% uh, there uh, represents about 311 million, and that's a 5.8% increase. While the capital budget at 256 million uh, represents a 7% decrease over the FY 2019 plan. The remaining items on the graph are budgeted to pay for the annual debt service, and that's about 43 million, and our contingency reserves at 58 million. And as a reminder, when we budget the contingency appropriation, 
Uh, it's for things that uh, really are to spend on unforeseen items. Could be emergencies or mid-year budget adjustments. And only city council has the authority to approve the use of that contingency. So some important takeaways of the budget as recommended. Uh, it's a balanced budget that once again keeps our financial principles intact and maintains services. There are no changes in the city sales tax rate or no changes in the property tax rate for the F FY20 budget. Uh, as discussed in the prior study session, staff is recommending a two-year adjustment in the city's water, wastewater, and solid waste rates. And overall, this budget uh, ensures that we address those important organizational objectives such as customer service, public safety, economic development, and maintaining those quality services for our citizens. So tonight, we're asking the council adopt the fiscal year 2020 tentative budget, which, set, which again sets that maximum budget appropriation. And then on May 21st, we'll be asking council to approve the final budget and the utility and solid waste rates. And that's followed by the property tax adoption on June 4th. Uh, that concludes my presentation uh, for 21R, adoption of the tentative budget for fiscal year 2020. Members of the council, any questions or comments? Thank you very much for that presentation. I would just like to say you mentioned, you know, you talked about collaboration and most certainly there is a tremendous amount of collaboration involved in this and as representatives of our districts and our citizens, we're all trying to meet different needs and um, you've all done a wonderful job of incorporating all of that into this budget and I'm just really grateful for all the work that everyone has put into this. Uh, so any, uh, with that, do we have a motion? A motion. Second. Please vote. And it passes unanimously. Okay, so moving on to item 22R, the capital improvement program for fiscal years 2020 through 2029. Provide a presentation on this 10 year capital program. Thank you. Uh, the CIP is a 10 year balance plan uh, that addresses projects that are needed or will be needed across a broad spectrum of areas. It's a dynamic plan w in which each year a great effort is put into updating <clears throat> this plan to ensure not only the critical needs are being met, but also that the cost, scope, and timing of all projects are coordinated throughout. Uh, putting together that 10-year plan has proven to be a year-round process. Uh, it starts in September when staff estimates and submits projects. Then in April, the city manager submits a recommended plan for council review. Uh, one of the key considerations is the city's ability to fund the ongoing operations and maintenance associated with each project. As such, the, pro the projected uh, operating impacts are incorporated into our long-range forecast uh, each year. Not only does the capital program provide a schedule of planned improvements, uh, it also identifies funding sources for those projects over the entire period. Uh, some of the key themes that went into developing this year's program include incorporating the projects that address the council pro policy goals, uh, key investments in preserving and maintaining our existing infrastructure, and delivering a full project that is well coordinated, meets our development standard, and minimizes disruptions to our citizens. And we plan for and incorporate the ongoing operations, as I mentioned earlier, in the, uh, and maintenance for those projects. So here's the 10-year. The city compiles that 10-year uh, program for capital improvement projects. This year, the total capital program is $726 million. Uh, this uh, Peoria's plan addresses projects that are needed or will be needed across a number of category types. Uh, that you see here. And as you would expect, the largest categories of the improvements are in our water at 33%, our wastewater at 19%, and our street improvements at 24%. Uh, the city is also making significant investments in areas such as parks, drainage improvements, and economic development. As mentioned before, this is a balanced plan uh, because we have identified funding sources based on reliable revenues to support both those one-time capital investments as well as the ongoing operating costs for every project in the 10-year program. 
As you can see, there are multiple funding sources that support this plan. Uh, the city's operating funds, 12% for those governmental funds and 28% for uh, enterprise funds. This is when we use that one-time fund balance to support those targeted improvements uh, in the community. So those are the kind of the pay-as-you-go projects. We also uh, have development impact, impact fees that are 12%, uh, and those are used to finance the growth-related projects. And as you can see, we continue to utilize the GO, or, which is uh, general obligation bonds, uh, for a significant portion of the general government type projects. Uh, the GO bonds are paid through the city's secondary property tax. Uh, revenue bonds at 18% support many of our utility projects for water and wastewater. And of course, transportation sales tax funds a number of important street improvements, maintenance, and transit related activities. We spend a considerable amount of time prioritizing the projects and evaluating available funding sources to ensure that we could address council's <laughs> highest priority needs. And here are a number of important projects included in the proposed CIP, including uh, Paloma Community Park, uh, the expansion at the Pyramid Peak Water Treatment Plant, uh, and numerous transportation projects that address traffic and drainage needs throughout the city. Uh, three weeks ago, the Development and Engineering Director, Adina Lund, uh, gave a presentation in detail on the projects uh, that are included in the 10-year CIP. So with that, we are asking Council to adopt the proposed fiscal year 20 through 29 capital plan. And then on May 21st, we'll be asking Council to approve the first year of the capital plan as part of the overall fiscal year 20 uh, adopted budget. And that concludes my presentation for 22R, the Capital Improvement Program for fiscal year 20 through 29. Thank you. Council, any questions, comments? Seeing none, do we have a motion? A motion. Second. Please vote. And it's unanimous. Thank you for that presentation. Okay, we're going to move along to uh, the Vistancia Community Facilities District Board meeting. The first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The consent agenda consists of items 23C, approval of the January 8 minutes. Board, do I have a motion to approve those minutes? Second. Please vote. That passes unanimously. And next item is new business, item 24R, proposed fiscal year 2020 budget and tax levy for Vistancia Community Facilities District. Great, thank you, Vice Mayor Ann. Sonia Andrews, the Chief Financial Officer for the City and serves as a Finance Director for the Board, will provide a presentation for you on this. Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, thank you, Mr. Tyne, and good evening, uh, District Board members. This item before you tonight is the proposed budget and tax levy for the Vistancia Community Facilities District, or CFD as we call it. CFDs also go through the same budget process as the city, so we have a tentative budget, and at the next meeting we will have a public hearing and final adoption of the budget. The proposed budget for the Vistancia CFD totals $4.6 million. The main item in the budget is debt service. Funding for the budget comes from property taxes from the Vistancia CFD. The tax rate proposed is the same as last year at $2.10 per $100 of assessed value. There is no change to this tax rate. We are asking the district board to adopt the proposed budget and tax levy tonight and establish a public hearing um, date of May 21st to review and adopt the final budget. That's all I have. Are there any questions? <coughs> Seeing none, do we have a motion? Move to adopt. Second. Please vote. And it passes unanimously. We will move on to the Vistancia West Community Facilities District Board meeting. 
First item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The consent agenda consists of item 25C, approval of the January 8 minutes. Board, do I have a motion to approve those minutes? Please vote. It passes unanimously. Moving right along to the next item of new business, item 26R, the proposed fiscal year 2020 budget and tax levy for Vistancia West Community Facilities District. Great, and then we have Ms. Andrews to provide presentation. Thank you. Thank you. This item, like the Vistancia CFD, is <laughs> the proposed budget and tax levy for the Vistancia West CFD. The proposed budget totals 3.9 million, it includes the debt issuance for water infrastructure and also debt service. And like the Vistancia CFD, the uh, funding for this budget also comes from property taxes in the Vistancia West CFD. The tax rate proposed is the same at $2.10. It hasn't changed from last year. So we're asking the district board to adopt the proposed budget and tax levy and also established May 21st as the public hearing date and final adoption of the budget. Board members, any questions, comments? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. A, second. a second. Please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is call to the public for non-agenda items. I do not have any speaker requests at this time. So we will move on to reports from city manager. Mr. Great. Tyne. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Appreciate that. And um, um, I'll hold off on our plan presentation on spring training until the next council meeting. I just wanted to make a quick comment of how much it's been an honor to work with Leah and Frank up here on the dais and uh, watching them continue to grow and develop and looking forward to hearing from you again shortly. But that's all I have, Vice Mayor. Great. So we will now move on to uh, reports from the City Council and we will start with uh, the Youth Council Liaison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I would just like to, like to say it's truly been an honor to be able to sit up here on the dais with the city council members and the mayor. Uh, the youth liaison position is such an amazing opportunity for the youth that this council has set up. I've learned so much while serving as youth liaison, like how to act in a professional environment, leadership skills, and how city government actually works. Uh, I'd like to thank my family and my parents for all their support. Uh, City Manager Jeff Tyne for being so helpful and kind. Uh, George and Don uh, for helping me through this process. And all of the great city employees I've met. And of course, I would like to thank the City Council and the Mayor for all their help. Uh, I hope I have served the youth and the youth liaison position well. I'm very excited to take what I've learned here into my future careers and pursuits. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember Patena. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> so my council assistant, Daniel, put a nice piece of paper together for all the things I did between the last meeting and this meeting. And somewhere between the dais and that table, I lost it. So, <laughs> so I'm going to uh, not give you dates, but I'll, I'll try to go from memory. Uh, we held a shred-a-thon over at Westbrook Village but of course it's open to anyone in the city. And uh, it started at eight o'clock, ended at 10. Uh, and our first car was there at seven in the morning. Uh, we ha served over 250 cars and it was, lasted from eight o'clock till 10 o'clock. And at 10 o'clock when the trucks pulled out, that's when the last car came in. So uh, it was a full two hours. I had the opportunity to speak to the Westbrook Village Veterans Group. Uh, I gave them a speech about what it means to be a veteran and told them uh, they wanted to know how the city connects with its veterans. And believe it or not, the city does quite a bit uh, in connecting with the veterans. And so I went over that with them and some of the things that were happening uh, throughout the city. Um, I met with the uh, Mason's Lodge, people at the Mason's Lodge just across the Monroe. 
where they awarded a, a police officer and a fireman um, some type of award. Uh, and so I, uh, this is the third year. Uh, they had a meal for us, and then we got to go into their kind of that inner sanctum, and uh, they gave the awards on. It was it was a, a really nice event, and they're going to have another again next year. I attended the uh, police award night. Uh, that was a really interesting evening. Uh, this mayor and council, they believe in making sure that our police and fire are the best equipped that they can be and the best trained. Um, there was a category uh, for life-saving at, uh, at this event, and uh, there were four lives that were saved. And these, these police officers and, and, and firefighters, they're, you know, they're making <clears throat> split-second decisions on giving somebody CPR or somebody pulling a weapon on them, and they're able to, able to defuse it. Um, you know, we tout ourselves as a small city uh, atmosphere, but we have big city problems, and our police and fire uh, really do handle these well. And like I said, they're out there saving lives and making these split uh, split second decisions. So it was a great event, and I enjoyed uh, enjoyed being there. This past Saturday, uh, I held a park fest over at Sunrise Park. Uh, Bill Moss was in charge of it. He always does a great job. We had uh, Mary Poppins was the movie. Uh, as I was driving up, I was watching, you know, parents bringing their kids and wagons and backpacks and chairs, and it was really quite nice to see. It's a free evening for parents and their children. Uh, we had free hot dogs, free sodas, free kettle of corn, free snow cones, and a free movie. So uh, can't complain about the price. And it was uh, we had a nice crowd there. It's one of my favorite city-sponsored events, and they, again, uh, the city staff does always does a great job. I had the privilege uh, this afternoon of serving our employees. Uh, it was nice to be able to recognize all of their hard work uh, that they put in and all uh, the good things they do uh, for our city and all the things they do to help us out. I'd like to say welcome to Danette Dunn, our newest council member. Looking forward to working with you. And congratulations to our youth liaisons, and thank you for everything you've done over the past year. That's all I have, Vice Mayor. You did pretty good without that list. Yeah. I don't know where it is. It's a nice job winging it, Bill. <laughs> Council Proud Member Finn. Proud of you. Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone in the public who extended their thoughts and prayers for our firefighters that were injured uh, in that unfortunate um, accident. And I'm very, very thankful that they are getting better. They're on the mend. It's got a little bit of a long road to go, but I'm um, very, very thankful that they are okay, and um, they're going to um, hopefully be back on the job at, at uh, some point. I want to commend the mayor for an, an amazing um, state of the city um, address that she, she did. I got to see it for a second time. Bill and I both went um, on Saturday morning and saw it for the second time, and Bill, you did a fabulous job in the video the second time, too. I was amazed. You killed it. You crushed it. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Um, <clears throat> So she did a phenomenal job. I love the format. My hat's off to the staff that helped put that together because that was just incredibly well done. I think it was very well received by, by those in the audience. Danette, welcome. Glad to have you on the council and outgoing youth liaisons. I wish you all the best, all of the best and thank you for serving. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilman Edwards. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, yes, welcome aboard, Danette. Uh, hope to see great things from you and anything you need, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, I want to thank all the residents that came out uh, last week to the uh, neighborhood meeting that we had over uh, for the new Meadows Park. Uh, we got a pretty good input from a lot of residents, and it's really, really nice to see input and get input from residents and what they want to see, what kind of amenities they want to see in the park. So hopefully we'll be able to incorporate some of what they were looking at um, into that park. So uh, more to come on that. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, if you have any questions about it. Um, Last weekend, I attended the uh, Dolly Sanchez Easter egg hunt. Once again, bigger and better than ever. I want to thank staff and the Sanchez family for putting it on. We had over 9,000 uh, people attend that event. It just seems to get bigger every year. Uh, someday, we're probably going to run out of room at the sports complex, but that maybe we'll move it up to uh, Paloma Park when, when that opens. But um, again, thank you, everybody, that came out to that. Um, I attended the mayor's state of the city and, and has 
Councilman Finn said it was inspiring and it's always nice to see the vision that she has and, and guide us uh, to see how we're going to shape the city for uh, the next generation and, and beyond. So I loved attending that. Um, attended the Paloma Park groundbreaking. Uh, Vice Mary did a phenomenal job in the presentation and that's just gonna be a phenomenal amenity to the north end of the city. Uh, more to come on that. It's just truly going to be a, a premier park in the North Valley or in the Northwest Valley. So uh, thank you so much for that. And then I just want to give a shout out to uh, Vistancia Elementary and Sunset Heights Elementary. They um, were the two winners of the plastic bag challenge that the city of Peoria uh, put on. And uh, Vistancia was able to raise 2,937 pounds of plastic and Sunset Heights raised 2,849 pounds of plastic that was now not going into our landfill. So great job uh, to the youth of Peoria. Uh, hope that more schools next year will, will participate and we can triple these numbers. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate. They're, they're all gone now, I think. It's probably bedtime and homework time, but uh, I really look forward to the Constitution Contest every year because I've been in that classroom trying to motivate kids to do that kind of writing, the big kids, that is, not the little ones. And I was very proud that Peoria High School had three winners in uh, the ninth and 10th grade category. Um, and congratulations to all of our new uh, boards and commissions members that uh, were in, invited in, they're not actually sworn in, but welcomed in tonight. Um, I believe they will get a lot out of their service and I know that they will give a lot to our city. So it's a very reciprocal kind of volunteerism. Uh, I attended the police awards also and what a fun brotherhood that is. And they're so committed to service and they love their jobs, they love uh, what they do, they love the people they serve, and I agree with Bill. Some of the stories that they told about the rescues and saving lives just makes me very proud uh, to have an association with those guys and gals. The State of the City Address. Um, Jen, congratulations to your department for carrying out a new vision that our mayor had. Uh, you know, words can do a lot. Uh, as I said before, I, sh I spent my life shaping words and using words, but there's nothing like a picture. And the, the visuals in that documentary just overwhelmed me with what a beautiful city we live in. It's just breathtaking, the northern parts, the trails, uh, and nothing could have shown that as well through language as that video did. And it could not have reached as many people. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think we have four more uh, dates to show that around. I think we had six altogether and we've done two. So uh, I don't have those all memorized. I know one's at the community center, I think the next one. So. Uh, just watch your paper, watch your uh, your uh, Peoria connection to see where and when those are. When one will be close to your neighborhood. Uh, wow, you can't come down here without noticing the five intersections that now have art on them. They're amazing. Uh, we had to hurry up the last three because it got hot, and our painters were practically passing out. But they are all five done now. Paloma Park, again, what a beautiful setting for that park. That is just gonna be amazing. And I know what a relief it's going to be to those uh, parents who have to drive all the way down to Pioneer Park so their kids can play uh, softball. Uh, it was my pleasure to deliver over a thousand books that I had acquired to uh, the Academy of Maths and Sciences, the new charter school right over here, just east of uh, Walmart. Uh, they were going to do a completely digital book library and I said, no, uh, we need books to hold on to and smell and kids need to fall in love with reading through the tactile 
uh, embrace. And so I helped them acquire over a thousand books, and that's just to start their library. Uh, welcome, Danette. You're in for the ride of your life. Um, can't wait to see how you progress. I know I've talked to you enough to know you have big plans for Pine District, so uh, you're going to enjoy it, and we're going to enjoy working with you. And that's all. Thank you. Council Member Dunn. Hello. I, I just wanted to uh, share my gratitude for being able to be up here and serve, and for so many of the people that I have met over the last week. We have a fabulous staff. I got to serve um, at the Municipal, Municipal Operations Center uh, breakfast, and I got to talk to so many different people that work in uh, so many different areas, and it was not only fascinating, but I'll tell you, they, they know what they're doing out there, so that, that was kind of neat. And then today at lunch as well. So I've been meeting a lot of people. Everybody's been very helpful. Um, congratulations to the two uh, youth liaisons. Um, sorry I didn't get to serve but one <laughs> meeting with you, but yeah, you guys are on to really great things. Um, I did take some time and I went over to Heart Pantry and they service our youth. Um, so, you know, they prepare meals so they have uh, food for the weekend and afterwards, and it was just really a great um, opportunity to see some of the work that is done here locally in Peoria. Very um, heartwarming. And I did want to remind everybody, uh, there's a lot of input that needs uh, to come from the community. Um, they, you have till May 12th to put your input for Country Meadows on that type of park, the equipment that you would like to see. And they, you can um, go on the city website, and there's also a survey monkey. Um, it's kind of a long web ad address, but it's uh, uh, surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash country meadows. And again, uh, their survey ends to, uh, on May 12th. So we really would appreciate all the comments because we want to get it right for everybody that lives in the community. So thanks again, and grateful to be here. Thank you. Uh, youth Liaison Gilbertson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm so honored. I can't believe it's my last meeting. It's gone by so quick. Um, I've grown so much and learned so much from you. And I just want to like extend my thanks to the city because the opportunities that the youth are given to like voice their opinions and volunteer are just amazing. And um, I don't know, I'm just lost for words. I'm just really thankful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to say that uh, congratulations to both of you, Leah and Frank. Um, it's been my honor really to sit here with you and watch you grow. You've come a long way from day one to where you are today. So um, just look forward to hearing about much future success from both of you. Uh, Council Member Dunn, welcome. You worked really hard to get here, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Uh, also, um, Happy Employee Appreciation Day. I just made that up. But I, um, you know, we did have two events. You heard this uh, it referenced in, in the comments here. And I just want to acknowledge all of the employees uh, working for the city of Peoria so hard. There's uh, an element of authenticity that comes from our city, from our employees. It's from the people, really. And, um, you know, we got out there and served a little bit. I was kind of late to the party today, but um, it's just a small token of our appreciation, and I hope you felt it because we really do appreciate you, and it takes everyone together to move this city forward. Uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.